燃え上がれガンダム<音楽>ゴンダム。Detailing in depth your descent into Gundam Mania, which I am a huge fan of. Yes, I think it's a good way to put it because、uh, today we are talking about Double Zeta Gundam, which is the next main show in the, in the franchise continuity. We're going through the Universal Century continuity, and that's our main focus today. But it is by no means the only Gundam thing I have been doing, Sean. Yeah, uh huh. Uh huh.、Um, let's see. I am now five volumes deep into the Thunderbolt manga. And I own the first seven volumes. And that manga is absolutely stupendous, and everybody should read it. Whether or not you've seen the anime, the, the manga, as much as I love the anime, the manga is even better.、Um, let's see. I, I've also seen Char's Counterattack. I'm not going to pretend I haven't. That is a future episode of Weekly Suit Gundam that we may or may not be recording at the same time, but I've seen that. I've read the first volume of the origin manga. I own the Yoshiyuki Tomino novelization of Gundam. The, the one where Amuro dies at the end. We've talked about that before.、Uh, yeah. I have not, have not read that yet, but I am looking forward to it. And, Sean, this is where we have to start today. I have built two of my own Gunpla. I am holding up to the camera right now my Char、uh, Custom Red Zaku 2. This is, the, this is actually a very recent Gunpla they put out, tied in with the Origin OVA series. And it is fucking cool as shit, and I love it. And I have also built. My favorite mobile suit from the original series, the Gyan. And because it's all to scale, you can see the Gyan's beam saber is about as tall as Shar's Zaku, <laughs> <laughs> which is amazing. And that fucking shield is so cool that comes with it. Anyway, so I'm all the, I'm, I am very much descending into Gundam Mania, Sean. I,、uh, I, think, I think you've broken me. You, yes, you, gave and... me. you gave me a push, and now I am moving all on my own. The training wheels、yes. are off. Absolutely, yeah. It, it was definitely the first like, few episodes of Weekly Suit Gundam was, yeah, like me pushing you on with your training wheels and the sunset in the background. And now you're like doing the Tour de France, basically, is, <laughs> is where we're at. You, you accelerated very quickly. But that's great for me because then it motivates me to go deeper into my Gundam bullshit. So I have been reading the, the Tomino novel in Japanese, which is like my new challenge for myself of like, Trying to continually improve my ability to read and speak Japanese.、Um, so, this is the first novel I'm trying to read, and it's very slow going because reading novels in Japanese is very hard. But I'm having fun with that. And then I also was motivated, since you were building Gunpla stuff, for me to upgrade my Gunpla because I've built the RX 78 Gundam, the original Gundam model. I built a Gundam Mark II. I built a Goof,、um, the Goof Custom from 08 The Mess Team. And all of those were high grade models. For people who don't know, Gunpla comes in different grades. High grade is the sort of most basic level. Then there's real grade, master grade, and perfect grade. I then made a, I've made a real grade Wing Gundam Zero from Endless Waltz. And then I made a high grade new Gundam, the Gundam from、uh, Shar's Counterattack, which is very cool.、Um, but then I decided I should upgrade and start getting into deeper stuff. So I got my first master grade Gunpla kit. Which、uh, is a big hurdle up because high grade and real grade kits are built to one 144 scale, 
So all the kits are made in the real scale of what like the sort of dimensions of the models are supposed to be. Master Grade is one in 100, so they're definitely a little bit bigger. Um, so I made a tall geese. I'm not done with it yet. I have like I don't have any of the extra stuff done. But I Holy have my shit. tall geese that I'm showing to Jonathan. It's very tall. It's very it big. Is. The best part about Master Grade kits that I did not know, though, is that because they're 1 to 100, that means they get to add a little extra thing that a high-grade kit would not be able to fit, which is there's a little cockpit. So the first thing you build is a cockpit. I'm showing you, Jonathan, to the camera. If you look into the cockpit, do you see a little... There's a little dude in there. Yep. They give you a little dude. They give you a little... You make a little chair, and you make a little dude, and you put the little dude in the little chair, and then you, you build the entire kit around that dude... And he is never coming out because there is no way to get him out of there without completely dismantling your gunpla. I had no idea, though, that they gave you a little tiny dude to put into your fucking model kit. And you almost will never see it. You will never see it unless you lower the hatch. But you always know there's a little tiny dude in there. I'm leaving him on my shelf and there's just a little dude sitting in that tall geese. That is amazing. Yeah, it's so much fun. Like, gunpla, we have not talked about a ton on this show yet because I hadn't done it yet. Um, yeah. It would have been very one-sided, but they are so much fun to build. Like I was intimidated, and this I will say the Shar Red Zaku I got for the high grades I think is probably kind of a higher level of difficulty than some of the other ones. Like if I had started with just a normal Gundam or something, um, mm -hmm. but I still had so much fun with it, and it was kind of fun to like trial by fire for some of it. And even then, it's it wasn't that difficult. It was a lot of fun, and in the end. Like, I didn't do a bunch of extra stuff. I have not gotten into panel lining or anything like that yet. And it still looks so fucking good. The hardest part by far was the Sharzaku came with, I think, 60 different stickers you had to apply. Okay, Which yeah. is a huge amount. And some of them are absolutely tiny. Like, like very difficult to apply. And I think I did, like, a pretty good job. And those stickers definitely fill it out, make it look very cool. And then the Sharzaku also comes with, like... A crazy amount of armament. He has two different machine guns. He has the bazooka, which you can do either on the back or you can actually have him holding it. It comes with two different versions of the heat axe, so you can either have him holding it or having it on the on the hip. There's so many cool things with it. Uh, I think the other kit I did, the Gyan, is not quite as good a Gundam kit. I wish it had the coloring of like the blue on the Gyan isn't quite perfect to me and it's it sucks because it's a it's a high standard because the Gyan only appears in one episode of Gundam and it is an unusually well animated episode of Gundam so I don't yeah. know if any model kit could ever live up to that um but it was still very fun to put together and the beam saber and the big ass missile shield you get is definitely the best part because it's all to scale so that shield that shield like would crush 50 humans on its own <laughs> It's amazing. Uh -huh. But yeah. they're so much fun. They're very relaxing to put together. You're cutting out all your little pieces. You get to use like these little cl plastic clippers and you get to use an X-Acto knife. And it's just, it's a lot of fun. And uh, they look really damn cool when you're done. And I, it's just amazing to like start with these just sheets of plastic and then have a Gundam model. It's crazy. I love it. Yeah, it's and it is definitely the moment when I took the plunge to do Gunpla was a big moment for me as like a person in a weird way of just like of, of I have never thought of myself as someone who could do like arts and crafty kind of stuff like I was always bad at that at school and never really put much time into it and but you know, I think it was when I was watching Gundam Build Fighters um which I rewatched since the last podcast that show is very good um uh th that like that show is obviously all about like people making gunpla and then battling them in this like pseudo sci-fi setting uh, and that was like, oh, maybe this is something I could actually do. And then the thing that really tipped it over the edge for me of like, well, I might as well try it is the fact that like an average high grade model is like 15 bucks. That's what they're I was going to say. They're so they're cheap. They're so cheap. It's unbelievable. Like, cause, cause I had always thought, oh, those Gunpla models, they must be like 50 bucks minimum. Right. Cause yeah. most models like that, that are that detailed and that opposable, um, even if you have to build them yourself, they, they're like 50 bucks or more, you know? And that's only like, they only get into that range if you're going for like really, really complicated master grade kits or perfect grade kits. Anything else is like, like my tall geese, I think was like $35. And that thing is like complicated and huge and ridiculous. And like, that's a really, really cheap 
like utterly reasonable like if not like sort of weird that it's that cheap kind of price yeah like both my zaku and my gyan were under twenty dollars and that's crazy for the amount of time you get to put into it and if you wanted to go way beyond what i've done and do all the panel lining and if you wanted to do any like paint touch-ups or anything like that like sky's kind of the limit with how much you could do with it and I think part of it is that it's a very smart, like, business model, because it is just these sheets of, like, printed 3D plastic, and then you have to cut everything out and assemble it, and I think that probably keeps the price down, but I also think it makes it more fun, because it's more fun to me than, like, a Lego kit where everything is, like, very nicely sorted for you and everything. It's like, you get to do a little bit more of the work. You get to feel like you're, you have more of a stamp on things. There's a little more of a skill threshold to it. And then also, Lego kits are insanely expensive. Like, I did this big Steamboat Willie Lego kit last year which is really cool it's my favorite lego thing i've ever built but it cost me a hundred bucks like i saved up for right. it um mm -hmm. and i do not regularly buy lego kits obviously because they're very expensive i could see like you know if i said every month i wanted to do a new gunpla 15 dollars a month is is nothing that's totally doable you know yeah like i've made one probably about every six months or so since i started like i just yeah. get the urge just like yeah fuck it like i'll just get something try it out and then like i try to like ramp up the difficulty of the models each time i go for it and yeah. it's yeah it's very very fun so people listening to this if you're getting into gundam don't be intimidated by like the gun plot thing obviously if you think you just would not be into it you might be maybe you wouldn't be into it but since it's such a low like barrier of entry like you just pay like 10 bucks to get like a good set of like two official gundam tools like that's the easiest route to go to get the stuff to help you build the kit and then like 15 bucks to buy whatever your favorite looking kit is and you're just good to go and it is so much fun when you get into it absolutely and then when you're done you have this cool toy that like if you are watching gundam and you're like man that char that red comet looks really fucking cool i'm gonna go oppose my red comet over there so it looks like he did in that he did in that episode of the show you can do that and feel like a little kid just having fun with your toys you know it can also help you recover from the crushing sadness of certain episodes of gundam <laughs> Yes, yeah. Or or just, like, live through the, the, the sadness of those episodes forever. If you want to yes. just, here's here's the most tragic thing I can recreate with my gunpla kits. Let's just leave them like that. Oh, boy. How many people die in Gundam Build Fighters, Sean? Oh, luckily, nobody. Okay. That's, the, that's the beautiful <laughs> thing about Gundam Build Fighters is it's just, like, everyone just gets to be friends and have a fun time. And, I mean, you know, it's Gundam Build Fighters is basically, like, what if... You did a sports anime, but had like everybody fight gunpla instead of play like basketball or tennis or something. That's so and great. It's very good. Yeah, I, I love that they've done great. that. I love that Gundam has been around long enough to get to that point. Mm -hmm. It's so cool. But here's the thing, Sean. I have now seen enough Gundam that I can say there is one piece of Gundam I didn't like. Okay. We have to talk about the show I watched in between Zeta Gundam and Double Zeta Gundam. Right, I forgot we haven't talked about this on the podcast yet. Yeah, I doubled back, I forward I guess, because it's chronologically earlier, production-wise it was later, and I watched Gundam 0083 Stardust Memory, which is nominally a Zeta Gundam prequel. It doesn't really have anything to do with the events of Zeta Gundam, like there's a little like lip service at the very end of the creation of the Titans, but it is basically just a in-between story, like One Year War, to the the grips conflict something that happened in the middle stardust memory it's an ova it's 13 episodes it's not bad i wouldn't say it's like it's extremely well made it might be the best animated gundam tv show in it's it would definitely be in the running for that like it's incredibly well animated it's got yeah. one of my favorite theme songs of all time the winner which is the first theme song and I was crushed. I was crushed when they replaced that theme song at like episode seven because it's such a good theme song. Um, but the theme song I think is better than the show because I just think on the level of story and characters, it is, it's very rote. It's very by the numbers Gundam. I think it's got one great character, which is the antagonist Annabelle Gatto, voiced by Solid Snake. What's his? I forget his name. Uh, Akio Utsuka. Yeah. Aki Otsuka, who is... It's amazing performance. His dad is also in the show, too. Is it Chico Otsuka or something? Um, he uh, voices, yeah, I think so. Yeah, he voices the captain of the Federation ship. So you get both father and son in the show. But Anna Valgato, who is a Xeon officer, who is like with the like Xeon resistance in 0083... 
um, I think is a phenomenal character. And like basically every step of the way, I just wished the show was about him because he's the only character with like a significant arc who has like who has real motivation in this universe. I think all the heroes are both boring and extremely dumb, which is a problem for Gundam. Like they are just a bunch of fucking dum dums. And then the biggest problem is the show's treatment of women. Like, Gundam shows that I've seen generally have great female characters. I think they have really interesting gender dynamics between men and women. When we get to Double Zeta Gundam, we can talk a little bit about how they do the little girl stuff. And that's, you know, there's questions there. But, like, generally, sure. I think there are a lot of interesting women characters in Gundam. Um, Nina Purpleton in Stardust Memory has a great name. She's the worst Gundam character I've seen so far. Like, just mm -hmm. just basically a shrieking hysteric for 13 episodes who's supposed to be, like, this brilliant engineer because she builds the Gundam in Stardust Memory. And then she is this, like I said, like, they... I'm not... I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be rude, but it's like the shrieking hysteric archetype is like what she is, like the whole show. And they do a really dumb twist near the end about her love interest with the, the two, you know, main characters of the show. And it just, I don't know, it kind of never goes anywhere interesting. It sets up this interesting rivalry between the main character, who's such a dumb dumb, I've forgotten his name, but he's voiced by Ryo Horikawa, so that's kind of cool. Uh, and then the, the Anna Velgato character... But then like, they never interact until the last episode, and they never really build a rivalry. And it just, it was kind of, a, I thought, a big, like, wasted potential. And was the, the only Gundam thing I've seen so far that I was not only not over the moon about, but kind of kind of was iffy on. Yeah, no, I basically agree with everything you've, you said about Stardust Memory. Like, it's something that I enjoyed it in the sense of, like, it is utterly gorgeous. I think the mecha designs are great, particularly, like, the two Gundams. Um, Gato's Gundam in particular is so fucking rad. It's like this big, like it's basically, you know, the weird Metal Gear connection. It's basically a Metal Gear Gundam because it's a Gundam as nuclear weapons platform. And that's a cool idea. Um, but then you get what is probably the most infuriating moment, maybe even more infuriating than what the fuck they do in Sea Destiny, which if we ever get there, we'll talk about that. But the stuff at the end of Stardust Memory with Nina and her like, do I am I in love with Ko the the Vegeta uh, of not the Vegeta of the show but voiced by Vegeta um, the protagonist of the show or am do I still hold a torch for Gato who is very cool but is also actively trying to destroy the Earth and is like a nuclear like neo Nazi terrorist and it's like lady I, I get you used to date this dude and I get that he's very fucking cool. Also, he's a, like, nuclear-armed neo-Nazi terrorist. Probably not the right moment to just decide, mm, I'm, I think I'm going to go with my old boyfriend in this, in this like, conflict. It's so, it's the most, like, absurd choice any character has ever made in a Gundam show. And it, like, I didn't love Stardust Memory up to that point. But as soon as that happens, I got, I got so fucking pissed off that, that... Because it is, it is what you're saying about like the weird like his like woman in hysterics uh, stereotype that Gundam almost never really deals in, and they just go full tilt with Nina Purpleton in a way that is so infuriating. Yeah, because I, it's I think the first Gundam show I've seen that is not at least nominally Tomino adjacent because like even stuff like the origin that he didn't directly work on, obviously those are all Tomino's, like, created characters, so his hand is going to be in it somewhere. This one really felt like, oh, there's, there's, this is really outside of, like, the normal authorship of Gundam that I've seen. Because, like, it's the only Gundam show I've watched where women don't pilot mechs. Which, like, yeah. that's not a thing in other Gundam shows. Women and men pilot mechs. In some cases, in Zeta and Double Zeta, I think there are way more women you see in pilot roles than men, if I'm not mistaken. Certainly on Zeta. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. like, in, in this one, there might be a villain or two, but certainly on the Federation side, it's, like, really um, segregated, where the men go fly the mechs and the women are behind doing, like, repairs and stuff. And it's just, all of it rubbed me the wrong way, because it doesn't feel right to the, the world that Gundam has, like, built and, like, the society it's showing. Um, which has lots of problems, but is not gender divided that way. Like, like clearly, like the military in Gundam times has moved past that, and yeah. suddenly they haven't in Stardust Memory. So that bothered me. Like I said, all the heroes are giant dum dums, and Ko is just a bad pilot. 
Like, he's just a bad mm-hmm. pilot. Like, I don't believe that he would get the upper hand on Anna Felgato at any point in the show because he never shows any real aptitude as a pilot because being a good pilot also requires, like, intelligence and strategy and things like that, none of which he ever shows. Ryo Horikawa, who I love, is kind of wasted in that part because it's... This would have been... This, this show is, like, early 90s, so he would have been on Dragon Ball for two or three years, but clearly he has not been typecast in the Vegeta role yet. And early Horikawa did do some of these, like, young boy parts. And it is very weird to hear him do that. Because it, like, I think of Horikawa as kind of like the grizzled, you know, angry dude. And he's playing, like, young, innocent, naive. And it's just, it's super weird. Because I realize, Sean, I don't think I've ever heard Ryo Horikawa say things like, Sumimasen. Because Vegeta right. does not say that. Or like, go man. It's like, no, Vegeta's never said I'm sorry. So I've never heard that out of Ryo Horikawa. And there's just a lot of moments where like, there's no real meat to the part. So he's kind of wasted. But like, you know, if you're moving through all the Gundam stuff, it's worth watching. It's only 13 episodes if you're going to be a completionist. But definitely the one show I've seen that does not feel essential. Yeah. And it definitely, it's a thing of where... Like, it's it's one of those that's, like, hard to talk to, about two people when you're, like, trying to recommend a different Gundam stuff of, like, when they... Because I think we talked about it a little bit on here of, like, well, yeah, it's, like, it's the Zeta Gundam prequel, technically. It is, like, technically supposed to set up how the Titans come about. But it is one of the things that's really disappointing about Stardust Memory is that if it is ever pitched to you that way, which is how it was originally pitched to me, it's, like... Well, I mean, yeah, Basque Ohm shows up in, like, the last five minutes or whatever, and it's like, aha, we will now, because of this, we can make fascists. And it's like, okay, <laughs> sure. If it was actually a show about how, like, if at the end of the show, Ko became a titan, and, like, they followed his pathway starting as, like, young, naive pilot that means well in the Federation Army, and ends as, like, one of the first... Um, like, you know, ace pilots in the Titan fleet, there's like, you could see, you could take basically all the elements they have and build out a decent arc that way, but that's just not at all what the show is actually doing. It is only like, there's a vague sense of, okay, yeah, the Titans happen after this, I guess because of what Gato does, but nothing in terms of the themes of Stardust Memory are about the, like, buildup of fascism within the Federation government. Yeah, I actually think... um... This is a weird comparison. I think Gundam Thunderbolt is a much better version of what Stardust Memory was trying to do. Because Mm -hmm. Stardust Memory, like for one, Thunderbolt starts in the One Year War, but very, very quickly, like by volume four of the manga, is past that and is into the post-One Year War period. And so it's into the like Xeon Resistance era. And so it does that a lot better. But I also feel like Stardust Memory is constantly being tugged in. Like clearly the meat of the story is with the Xeon characters. But Gundam in the early 90s had not yet done a story from the perspective of Xeon. Like, the closest you would come is War in the Pocket, which is from the perspective of a kid who's not aligned, but he does align himself with another, you know, basically kid who is a Xeon rookie. So, like, you're so far away from anyone with, like, ideological ties to Xeon. Thunderbolt actually, like, dives in and the most, the simp, there are two protagonists and the sympathetic one is the Xeon guy and the Mm -hmm. villainous one is the Federation guy. And I feel like it does such a better job of both the ace pilot rivalry, which is how Stardust Memory kind of pitches itself. And Thunderbolt does that so phenomenally well with E.O. Fleming and Daryl Lawrence. And then also I think Thunderbolt actually taking the plunge of like, let's actually do a Xeon story from that POV, which is really good to have and I feel like Stardust Memory kind of at certain points wants to be that with Ana Velgato and never commits itself. Yeah. So I agree. Oh well. But you want to talk about a really, really, really good Gundam show, Sean? Yeah, Jonathan, I I think it is time for us to dive into well, it's interesting because it's 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 a one of the great Gundam shows, but technically, according to its theme song, it's not actually an anime. No, it's anime real. Janai. They say it yeah. many times, every episode. Honto no kotosa. It's, it's real. It's all real. All Let's real. talk about Mobile Suit Gundam Double Zeta. Double Zeta, Sean. I mean, we should probably start with the elephant in the room, that the Western fandom are a bunch of dum-dums and don't like Double Zeta. Yeah, they watched like the first five episodes or something and thought, oh, it's a dumb comedy show for kids and then didn't watch anymore and then missed out on what is one of the best Gundam shows. Yeah. Uh, Although I will say, I take it looking online, that is not the opinion of the Japanese fandom, from what I can tell. 
Yeah, I think like especially when it was airing, um, it definitely like it won a number of different awards. I feel like I think people coming to Gundam later, even in Japan, kind of end up in the same boat of like it's not talked about quite as much as Zeta or the original show or Shars Counterattack. And if you're just sort of like dipping your toes into it after you watch Zeta Gundam and you don't like and you're not kind of like engaging directly with what Double Zeta is doing early on, I think it like makes such a weird first impression that people coming to Gundam after the fact get pushed away, whether they're Japanese or Western. But at the time when it was airing, it was popular. Like it was it was really well liked. Yeah, which you can tell by it also having like it having maybe an even bigger budget than say the Gundam because it is mm-hmm. spectacularly animated. But yeah, I mean, I kind of want to address it from the standpoint of that reaction because Double Zeta is an incredibly different show. Like certainly if you're going in the production chronology, it's the most different things that Gundam has done so far. And yeah. because it is the first show to have no Amuro, no Char, it is mostly new characters. Bright would be the big carryover. You also have Fa and Camille in small supporting roles here and there. Um, Shinta and Kum are there too, I guess. Um, that they kind of come in and out. And they're not ever major characters, I guess. Um, yeah. But yeah, so, so it, you know, if, if it, it is an outlier in that main continuity because the, the, the X factor between original Zeta and Char's counterattack is Char and Amuro, who are not in this one at all. Um and then all, this one also adopts a very different tone at different times. You had said on the previous episode of Weekly Suit Gundam that you thought um, Zeta, Double Zeta had, I don't know if in your words it was like a rough opening or just a too long opening. Like the first couple episodes were like like n- not exactly, those, those are where people have problems with it is basically what you were saying. Yeah, it's the first um, seven episodes, basically, first seven or eight, like depending on how you count the first episode, which is basically like a weird pseudo recap um, prelude of Double Zeta. Um, but yeah, it's the all the stuff when they're on Shangri-La. Like, and this is opinion I used to hold that I think it like it goes on for like three or four episodes longer than it probably should. I think they make the point they need to make in the Shangri-La stuff after the first three or four episodes when they're there, and then they kind of just repeat themselves a few times. Um, but that is where it is like explicitly comic. Like it is, it starts out as a comic anime, um, or the comedic anime. And then slowly as the characters start getting like introduced into the wider world and they go to space. And especially once they go to earth, it gets darker, darker, darker until you get like some of the stuff in Double Zeta, which I think is some of the darkest shit in Gundam. That's not Victory Gundam, which is just like horrifyingly dark. Um, yeah. So here's the thing. I unabashedly, 100%, love Head Over Heels, adore the first seven or eight episodes of Double Zeta. Yeah. And, and I think if the show has an issue, it's the seven or eight after that. It's when they get into space and Masha Meyer, who we will talk about, my boy Masha Meyer. Um, if you've been following me on Twitter, you know my love of Masha Meyer cello. It's cello, but it's spelled cello, which is even funnier. Yeah. Um, I think when he leaves... And then you have kind of a rotating cast of villains for a couple episodes who will be really well-defined later on, but are not in the early going. Glemmy and um, Chara Soon. I think the show has a little bit of an identity crisis in in transitioning from the kind of kiddie comic tone, very episodic, to trying to find a larger direction. And also just like the Argama is also just very literally directionless for the first 20 episodes or so, basically until they head back to the moon and get an actual mission. And I think that part, there is there are some episodes there that feel like a little aimless to me and a little wandering. But the stuff on Shangri-La, I love. I think it is a super interesting change of direction. And I think the trick Double Zeta plays in coming right out of Zeta Gundam, which is the darkest point in the franchise so far, and then switching POV. I think the first episode in particular, not the recap, but we'll talk, I do want to talk about that recap episode because I think it's delightful, but the, the first proper like narrative episode, um, The Boy from Shangri-La, I think the, the hat trick it plays in doing a complete POV shift and continuing the story in progress from where we were but now from the POV of Judo and then all of his friends who have no experience whatsoever with this war, with what's been going on, and also, unlike any other Gundam protagonist so far, and many since, 
have no connection to the larger war. Judo is not Amuro, whose dad built the Gundam. He's not Camille, whose parents were in the government. He He's not been around the war. Um, I think that's fascinating, and I think there is something subversively brilliant about what they do, particularly with Yazan in the first episode of having mm -hmm. this guy who was the most terrifying villain in Zeta who has just come off of killing a little kid and is now basically this, this comic relief character getting kicked in the ass because Judo and friends have none of that experience with him. I think that's brilliant. I think bringing in um, a villain in Masha Meyer who is also in a POV shift, very detached from the war as it has been going on so far. He is this young idealist who carries none of the baggage the villains in Zeta Gundam carried. And putting those two forces in opposition with poor, poor Captain Bright in the middle, basically just trying to get off of this fucking colony and back to the fight because everything he has tried has just been fucked at this point and he's having to rely on these stupid junker teenagers. I love that whole stretch. I think it is entertaining as hell. I love the characters, I love the dynamic, and I also think it's an interesting change of pace for Gundam to, for the first time kind of ever in, again, production order, just settle down in one place for seven or eight episodes and build kind of an episodic formula with what Mashemire is doing, with what Judo is doing, and have them change kind of like little by little each episode where Judo, his, his goal in the first couple episodes is to steal the Gundam, then it is he's actually helping, then it's, well, I'll help and get some food, but I don't know if I really want to be part of the crew, and just little by little get him to the point where he's going to go into space with them. Um, I think it's really entertaining and well done, and honestly, the thing it reminded me of most is the stretch in Dragon Ball Z that I know, I know both you and I love, the Great Saiyaman Saga, which is yeah. also a huge departure for Dragon Ball Z in that Dragon Ball's always comedic, obviously, but it kind of settles into almost a sitcom routine of being Gohan in high school for seven or eight episodes and just have fun with that. And it's such kind of a breath of fresh air in terms of how it, it shifts the stakes and, and sort of the personal dynamic of the show. And I think Z Double Zeta does that at the beginning. And I, again, I unabashedly love those episodes. Yeah, so for me, I think, like, one way for me that I should probably, like, talk about this is the difference between how I felt about it on first watch and then my rewatch from several months ago. Because one thing that was interesting was, so the first time I watched through Zeta Gundam, I really loved it, but I was slightly more lukewarm on the ending because I thought the ending of Zeta Gundam, which I still, if you don't watch Double Zeta, I think this is true of Zeta Gundam's ending, I think it wraps up too quickly. Like, I think it, I'm someone who, I don't generally like it when TV shows, like, and like like the last big climactic thing happens and then the TV show ends immediately. I like there to be a little bit more um, kind of like fallout and denouement and like dealing with whatever it was that like happened at the end of the show. Um, so at first viewing of Zeta Gundam, I was like, this is a really cool ending. There's a lot of great stuff about it. I wish that it wrapped up a little bit more because I didn't know anything about what Double Zeta was. And then I started watching Double Zeta and then immediately caught up to like, oh shit, this is... Like, and this is, I think, how people should think about Zeta and Double Zeta. They are one long TV show. Yes. It's not really, it's two phases of one longer TV show. They were made by the same production team. Um, like, the next, ev like, the, the play prelude of Zeta, or Double Zeta, aired the week after Riders in the Sky, the last episode of Zeta Gundam. So it's just like, they just went right into one another. Um, and obviously, the main character shifts to Judo, and a lot of things change. But also compared to any other, like, One Gundam show to its sequel, Zeta and Double Zeta are extremely similar. They share, like, the majority of the same mobile suits. There are a number of characters that come over. The world state is shared. They share an antagonist in Haman Karn. Like, they are, like, directly connected to each other. And, and in a way stylistic. That no other... Yeah, yeah, and stylistically yes. as well. Like, they are directly hooked to each other in a way that no other two Gundam shows are. And so for me, like, looking back on it, to me, it's very clear that Zeta and Double Zeta are meant to be understood as a pair, which is not true. Like, you know, Mobile Suit Gundam and Zeta Gundam, you can look at those completely separately, no problem. Zeta and Double Zeta, like, you have to, I think, kind of stick them together because Double Zeta is where you have this kind of second phase of the story where a lot of, like, the things from Zeta Gundam start up again, but we're, and we're kind of going through the, a similar cycle. But because we're with Judo, 
things turn out differently in, in, in judo and because he's different from Camille and because he's able to learn from Camille and Fa and Bright and the other people who went through the events of Zeta Gundam, he's able to improve on like the path that they were on. And that's one of the reasons why Double Zeta gets to be ultimately a much more positive, optimistic, happy, and hopeful show is because Zeta like goes so far down into like the, like the dark kind of like depression that that show has at the end like judo gets to kind of rise out of that and that's how i think i think of those shows and how they should be understood together so and that's on my first watching that was like that like kind of discovery process made me so fall in love with double zeta in the way that you're talking about now of like i loved all those opening episodes i thought it's like this is amazing this is such a like bold interesting like incredible departure and shift and way to like understand how changing the protagonist of your show and thus the viewpoint of the show changes everything about how you see the world around you and then having judo slowly kind of lose some of that as he goes and experiences the world um on second viewing i think my opinion of zeta gundam improved a lot um i mean not a lot i already loved it i just loved it more double zeta i think my opinion almost like kind of went down a little bit because i think the ways in which double zeta is inconsistent bothered me more on second viewing when I wasn't as sort of like surprised and intrigued by the things it was doing that I wasn't, that I didn't really expect. And that's where like, there are like two or three episodes in that opening salvo that are basically them just doing what the last episode again. And it's like slightly different, but not quite different enough. And then, but then you're also right that once they get into space, there are a couple of spots where it just kind of dips again and it doesn't feel like the show quite knows what it's doing. Um, it's finding itself and it's not truly till for me, it's like once they get to Earth, that's where it's like totally like locked in and Double Zeta knows what it's doing. And there are a couple of dips when you get like really close to the end, but more or less by the time you get to the Earth part, it is locked into what Double Zeta is and what it's trying to say all the way to the end. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think Double Zeta is the most inconsistent of the, of the three original shows. But for me, and, and again, maybe I'll think differently on a second viewing. I, I felt that inconsistency not in the opening Shangri-La part. I felt it in the initial run in space. I felt it, and then after they get back to space after Earth, I think, basically, my biggest complaint with Double Zeta Gundam is all the stuff with Sasara and Rasara, and we'll get to that later. Um, yeah. Because that's basically if Kukuru's Doan's Island became a recurring arc in the original Gundam, is how I would describe it. Which is, it's not, it's never bad, it just feels like it's out of a different show. Or like yes. a different version of the same, like an alternate universe version of the same show. That's what I mean. Um, so like there's points, yeah, there, I, I think Double Zeta has, um, I also think when we get to the end, I think this one has, uh, I, I like the final episode. It does not have the punch of the other finales that Gundam has to me, which is also to me okay because the penultimate episode has the punch and the yeah. final is kind of just a 20 minute denouement with some really, really, really good mobile suit action. Um, mm -hmm. Because the final fight with Haman Karn is the goods. But we'll get to that later. Um, yeah, so so I think we're in mostly agreement here. Because I actually don't even disagree with your assessment of those early episodes in that they are there are a few that are repetitive. I just kind of enjoyed it because I also was kind of okay with Gundam not holding itself to a crazy standard for a couple episodes and being like, sure. you know what? We can be in a, a normal TV show that maybe is just episodic for a couple of episodes and does a formula and plays on that formula. Because that's good TV shows do that all the time where they have a formula and it's, it's finding, it's kind of like jazz or something. It's finding the variations in that formula that is the fun. And Gundam almost never does it in that exact way. Like the first show obviously has pieces it it has on the board in every single episode but never quite in the same like it's the exact same character same location for several episodes in a row and like it was just just long enough to give me that kick and just short enough to not get annoying to me maybe it'll change on a second viewing but that's kind of, of was my thought um yeah uh, but uh, but i also agree that that i think once the show gets to Earth, and I do think it takes too long to get to Earth, because this show by far takes the longest to get to Earth of any Gundam show so far, because it's like in the 20s mm -hmm. when they finally get there, right? Um, uh, yes. Yes, it's like it it's in the 20s. Yeah, I it's think like, it's 23 or 22 is when, like, like, the 22 to 23 is when it happens. Yeah, so that probably should have happened somewhere in the teens, because 
Again, like the Argama doesn't really have a mission it's doing until they go to Earth, so it's a lot of the Argama is basically just trying to get away and trying to resupply. And that makes sense. The Argama was fucked beyond belief at the end of Zeta, and Bright is basically having to build a new crew from scratch. But I do think when it gets to Earth, there is so much good stuff. I think they find a lot of interesting variations in there. I like the double Zeta. It does get darker, but it never locks itself into a single tone. Like, there yeah. are still... There's there's a lot more standalone storytelling in Double Zeta Gundam, largely represented by all the two-parters they do in this show, where they will just... Like, there's one on Earth where they're going through the desert called Blue Team, which is just two episodes about this little desert town and this team of, like, Xeon remnants in these cool, sick-ass blue goofs and just kind of telling that story. That story has no larger bearing on the world of Double Zeta Gundam or the war, but I think it's just a good little story to tell. Um... And those are also ways Double Zeta, I think, lets itself stand out. And generally speaking, I think those standalone stories also get better as the show goes along. Um, so, so yeah, I think we're in general agreement about the overall trajectory of the show. Yeah, and it, it is, and the most important thing is that, like, that shift of, like, tra Zeta the tragedy to, like, it's not necessarily Double Zeta the comedy, although Double Zeta does have a, like, happy ending. Doesn't have, you know, Judo doesn't get married. No, that, it's not, like, comedy in that sense. But it definitely, it is that dichotomy and that kind of juxtaposition of the two shows that I think, like, you know, Tomino gets a lot of grip for being the kill em all Tomino, like he kills off characters. But a lot of his stuff tends to have positive endings. Like, I think as a storyteller, it's not everything. Um, again, Victory Gundam is out there and we'll get to it eventually. Which is, I mean, yeah, we'll get to it eventually. But he tends to like to end things more on an up note. He likes to have that kind of hope and optimism at the end. Or at least, like, even if it's dark, there's, like, a hint of it. And Zeta Gundam is actually kind of an outlier in that sense that, like, if you just take Zeta Gundam on its own, the ending of Zeta Gundam is fucked. It's like everybody's dead. Camille has been, like, reverted to the state of an absolute, like, child. And he can't, like, kind of understand the world around him. And Fa has to drag him back to the Argama. Like, that is a dark-ass fucking ending. And so Double Zeta needs to, like, first, I think it needs, it's right to just, like, flip the switch immediately and just go straight to Judo, who's a very different character. And then also to build to a very different conclusion where people do die in Double Zeta, but... You know, it's not like you don't in the, the Double Zeta and, like, Bicha and Mondo and L and Rue have all been, like, horribly murdered in the last three episodes. Like, that would that be the would be most tragic much. thing. Yeah, like, like, Double Zeta knows what it is and it knows, like, that you can't just follow up tragedy with tragedy and that you need to have an upturn. Um, and that's the thing that I love so much about Double Zeta is that it doesn't lean into the most kind of, like, self-indulgent instincts that sometimes Tomino can have about, like tragedy and darkness and it knows like it needs to have an evolving tone um, yeah. throughout it and in that way Double Zeta is an extremely rich show. And even though it's inconsistent at points, I do want to, I think at the top here we should just talk about some of the superlatives I think this show has. Like, I think this show has an even stronger cast of characters than Zeta in, mm -hmm. in general. I think Zeta's storytelling is better and Zeta also has more returning characters who kind of create interesting dynamics but i think if we're just talking about characters new to the show the the shangri-la crew is one of my favorite sets of gundam characters and their evolution i think is in many ways just as powerful and interesting as the evolution of the white base crew in the original show um i mm -hmm. think double zeta has a better cast of villains than zeta gundam had zeta gundam has a ton of villains and many of them are amazing part of that is they get to carry over haman karn so they just get to keep that and then all of i think the people around haman karn particularly glemmy toto which i i know it's spelled glemmy i need to say it gremmy because that's how they say it and it sounds better that way but uh, particularly gremmy toto and um Mashemeyer just are th that like trio of villains and then chara soon depending on the episode um there's there's a lot of good stuff there I think the mobile suits are mostly a carryover from Zeta, but with the new ones they add, I like them even more in this one. I think Double Zeta has the best animation of these first three shows. Like, it is consistently utter top-notch, and especially in the last 20 episodes or so, there's some insane stuff they're doing in this in this television series with the animation. Um, so those are all... Th and, and I do think that the, the general evolution and way it treats POV and in the end thematically ties it all back in to the other pieces of Gundam 
is all really beautifully done to me. And, you know, I, I think the way I would describe... If I were to compare this to any other piece of media, I think Double Zeta is kind of like Return of the Jedi in Star Wars, in that it's yeah. the third piece of a trilogy, it's coming after the really dark movie, but if, if Double Zeta probably has the lowest points of the original trilogy of Gundam shows, which it probably does, if you're listing, like, the worst parts of Double Zeta... I also think it has some of the absolute highest highs, and I know you agree with me on that. And Return of the Jedi yeah. is the same way, right? So I think that's, mm -hmm. if you're thinking of like a trilogy, that's kind of the, the closest kind of document I could put this towards. And overall, also thinking Double Zeta is a better thing overall than, than Return of the Jedi is, because its its high points are more plentiful and its low points are much less plentiful. There's no Ewok equivalent in Double Zeta or anything. Um, but those those are just some general superlatives I would give the show while we're thinking overall thoughts. Yeah, I I absolutely agree, and especially it is the the Gundam team of like all the kids from Shangri La. I love all of them; they're, oh, so, they're great. so great. And it is that like how you start the show with them just being all these punks, just trying to like kind of get by in a shitty situation. Um, and it's them like like the most kind of direct like kind of class consciousness stuff Gundam has done. Uh, up to this point like class is something that exists in Gundam but it's but we don't like kind of focus on it ever before this and then that early stuff in Shangri-La and seeing the ways that Judo's life is like materially incredibly different from where Amuro and Camille come from who both came from places of relative privilege um like that's really interesting and then them kind of growing up throughout the show by the time you get to the end where beach is the fucking captain of the nail argama and Judo is just like the most badass Gundam pilot around um, and everybody, and you know, and L is piloting a Gundam, Rue is piloting a Gundam, um, Mondo is there. Mondo's the one who's the, probably the most kind of tacked on, and then Eno's just... Oh, like, I love Mondo. Nice. Don't, don't put down Mondo. I mean, I, that's not a criticism, like, Mondo's just the one who doesn't have, like, yes. he doesn't have a mobile suit that he's the regular pilot of. He, he pilots whatever mobile suit is free at the time. Exactly. He's, he's there to, like, he's there for emotional support, and then Eno is my nice, sweet, precious boy who's just, like, very nice and good and kind and should probably get a different haircut uh, because he looks very goofy <laughs> with the bowl cut, but I love him. Oh, I love him, too. I've also got to shout out my boy Mondo for his voice actor, which is uh, Kozo Shioya, who is the voice of Majin Buu in Dragon Ball. And mm. he's an amazing actor. It took me the longest time. Because from the moment Mondo showed up, I was like, I know that voice. I know that voice so well. Who is it? And I finally figured it out, like, 30 episodes in. And I think it's because Kozo Shioya, he plays every version of Boo in Japanese Dragon Ball. Which means it's a huge gamut of different Boo voices. And I'm not yeah. used to any particular one. And Mondo is, like, halfway between fat Boo and kid Boo, I feel like. It's like a mix of those. It's it's very screechy. It's very adorable. I love it. Um, and I loved hearing him here. All the voices are good. That's just one where I was like, I know that voice. And it was like itching at me for 30 episodes. But like Bicha and Mondo, for the like basically the teens episodes, 10 to 20, they're over with Neo Zeon. And they've completely betrayed the Argama. And then they come back and eventually rise to this point where they're two of the most reliable people on the ship. Like, I think the arc they take these kids on is fucking awesome. And and actually, in the in the final stretch, when you get the nail, uh, not how are you supposed to say it in English? Nail just, argama. Okay. Yeah. I just I I'm th I think of it as just Neru argama, which is how they say it, obviously. Um, but the new argama. Um, it goes well beyond where the other Gundam shows have ever gone with like their their group of kids because you actually take Captain Bright off the board for the final you know ten episodes, which is really really interesting as a dynamic I think. So yeah, I, I fucking love those kids. They're so great. Absolutely. So where do you where do you want to go with this discussion? Let, How do you want to tackle this? Yeah, let's talk about the characters because we can get back to the other kids if you want. Um, we love them, but Judo. Sean, the fucking hat trick that they did three 50-episode shows, each with a protagonist who is of a somewhat similar mold or archetype. Judo is the most different, obviously. Um, and they're all, I think, equally great characters. Like, Amuro has clearly had the most staying power just because there's a, you know, there's a billion alternate versions of original Gundam and Amuro has proved to be, like, a very um, versatile figure. But I would not put Camille or Judo at a lower level. I think they're fucking great characters. They're all, I think, equally compelling protagonists who carry these shows. And 
that's a I really thought after Camille in Zeta Gundam, I was like, that's gonna be the hardest part of Double Zeta is finding a character who is similarly interesting but is different enough to keep this ship going. And they totally did it, and I am blown away that they did it three times in a row. And Judo is I love him just as much as the other two. He's so good. Yeah, I love Judo to death. He's he's one of my favorite Gundam protagonists. And he's he's like one of the things that I love about Judo is again like looking at the sh- like the Gundam cycle or whatever, where he's the last sort of pilot of that original kind of trio of shows. And since the movie just uses Amuro again, he's the last like proper Gundam pilot we get from this like opening salvo of Gundam. He's like, there's a reason why he's the one who gets to kind of put this conflict to an end, like especially the one that carries over from Zeta with Haman Karn, that he's of, of our three Gundam boys. He is the one that is the most like put together um, he's the one that, like, he doesn't have this, like, the, like, weird sort of depression that Amaro has. You know, that even when you meet Amaro, he's, there's clearly something up with him that he's not eating and all that kind of stuff. Camille's just fucking pissed off all the time and just, like, punching people out. And Judo just, like, partially because I think of his relationship with Lena, and so he's a big brother, so he has, like, responsibility. I think partially because of his background that he doesn't come from a place of privilege. He doesn't come from like a nice cozy um new space colony you know his dad is not the guy who made the gundam his dad is some like junker who's god knows where you know he doesn't know where his parents are um that like gives him the capacity to be like a different kind of new type that he has a different like i think ability for empathy and compassion like very very early on that amar and camille kind of have to learn that judo already kind of has he already has that he already has his his love for Lena. He already has this like big group of friends. You know, it's not like Camille has Fa, and that's and like Fa's like the only dude that Camille or the only person that Camille knows that like likes him. You know, everybody else you meet in the first two episodes of Zeta Gundam kind of hates Camille or at least makes fun of him and just kind of like doesn't like him very much. Whereas like Judah's got like this whole band of buddies together, and so he's the one who kind of. Once he's thrust into these more extraordinary circumstances, he's the one that like keeps the most level head out of all of our other Gundam protagonists. And that's what allows him to, in the ending, like he's the one who's able to like make this very cogent argument in the penultimate episode to Glimmy about what it is that all the Gundam protagonists have been fighting for. But Judo is the one who is finally able to kind of give the speech and make the argument and stand there and be like, this is why, this is what like a new type kind of means for us. This is like how you motherfucking adults have been destroying the world around us. And this is like what we need to do to stand up and fight for the earth and fight for each other. And it's such a satisfying moment when finally we get like our protagonist that is so well put together that he is the one that is able to kind of articulate what everybody has been fighting for up to that point. I agree with all of that, and I think it's also the way the show plays with Judo's motivation. Because Judo is probably the most highly motivated Gundam protagonist. In yeah. in terms of, there's never a moment where he's searching for something to fight for. It's always there. Early on, it's just fighting to survive, fighting to live. He's, he's a junker who's trying to get money, right? And that's a certain motivation. When they get into space, Lena is kidnapped very early on. And so that continues for basically until her fake death. We, I thought it was very real, Sean. That Lena's blood two-parter kicked my ass good. I, Are you supposed to have any hint that she's not dead at that point? I think just the fact that you don't see a body is okay. like... Because I was suspicious that maybe she was alive. Because I thought that like even Tomino would not just murder Lena like that. That'd be... But even it's I such, thought that was like, that's a step too far. But it's such a Tomino death where she is dying of a bullet wound and then Judo is fighting another mobile suit that he knocks into the building that she is in and crushes it. That seems like the most Tomino way to kill Lena. So that's what made me buy it. I'm getting off track. Anyway... So he is super highly motivated through all of that. And in fact, until Lena's blood, that two-parter, he's really not part of the, the team. He is not fighting against Neo Zeon. He is not fighting for a cause. He's fighting to save his sister. And like he is constantly going out on his own and he is breaking orders and he is not listening to Captain Bright. Captain Bright really at some point should have installed locks on those goddamn Gundams because the kids just keep on stealing them. 
And so he's very motivated through all of that in a very interesting individualistic way. And then I think after Lena dies, that motivation turns into something much broader and something much more team-based. And so there is this constant set of motivation. And obviously highly motivated characters are the most interesting characters. And I think that motivation also being tied to this constant evolution where that motivation keeps broadens from like the self to the family, to the constructed family, to basically the future of humankind as he lays it out in the final speech. Um, I just think that evolution is so finely sketched and the way they mirror it through all of the background characters also on the Argama um, makes for one of the most satisfying just senses of growth in the whole Gundam franchise that I've seen so far. Yeah, absolutely. He's just... He's, he's just also just a very like charismatic compelling character like, yeah. you just want to like see him grow you want to see him overcome um what he runs into and then he, like he bounces off of the other characters so well and like one of my favorite things about judo again in that sense of like he's the most put together gun protagonist as i love the first time that he meets uh mr wong who is a character <laughs> love a that leftover scene. character yeah from zeta who is just like a capitalist who's you know like supports the aug and he beats the shit out of Camille the first time he runs into Camille and Camille's like, you know, being, you know, impudent and not following orders and all the kind of stuff that Camille would do. And Mr. Wong beats the shit out of him um, to like, quote unquote, correct him, which is one of those, th like the many things that like adults do in Zeta Gundam, thinking that it's going to make things better. And they're like slowly pushing Camille eventually towards his tragic conclusion. And when Judo meets Mr. Wong, Mr. Wong tries to do the same thing, and Judo's not having any of it. Nope. And Judo kicks his ass. And it's like so great. It's just like like I just love Judo's ability to like actualize what our Gundam protagonists have been thinking every like so far, Amaro and Camille, which is like these adults fucking suck. They're constantly like they're corrupt, they're hypocritical, they're constantly abusing their power. Um, they're the ones that should be the responsible ones. They're the ones who should be fixing these situations. And yet it's always falling on these like young kids to do it. Fuck these guys. I'm going to like, I'm not going to get punched by Mr. Wong. I'm going to fucking punch Mr. Wong's lights out. Yes. Fuck that guy. And this is, this is my overall thesis about Double Zeta Gundam is Double Zeta is to Zeta what Zeta is to the original, which is to say that it yeah. is a very smart reaction to an evolution of. So that goes with tone. It goes with the kinds of characters it chooses and it also goes with how it interacts with scenarios familiar from the previous show because zeta is constantly reconstituting familiar scenarios in a new light and double zeta does it sometimes more subtly but sometimes in i think very compelling interesting ways with things like that scene with mr wong which i agree when i got to that point that was one of those moments where i'm like double zeta knows exactly what it's fucking doing you know yeah. You do not need to doubt this show. And just a quick shout out to Judo's voice actor, because we've obviously shouted out the voice actors for Camille and um, Amuro before, but Kazuki Yao, who I'm looking through his credits. I've definitely, you, everyone's heard him in things because he's been in a million things. Not typically, I think, as the leading man, um, but he's so good as Judo. It's just, it's a very like, movie star kind of performance like i think of judo as like the movie star of the group like you could see him in a hollywood adaptation pretty easily yeah he's definitely like the most handsome of the gundam protagonists he's got a dope red jacket yep. he, he looks really good in yeah he's just a cool dude i love judo love judo. i'd hang out with judo yeah like he's just like he's the only gundam protagonist that like i feel like like i would eat lunch with in high school or something compared to like amaro and camille like it'd be very uncomfortable you know if you had off block with them you wouldn't want to hang out with them it'd just be like weird and you'd have to go on weird conversations and camille might start like punching somebody judo is just like chill out have a fun time yes judo's great i love all the other characters from the shangri-la crew and then I think while we're talking about those kids it's worth talking about one of the really really cool things this show does which is They've got enough Gundams around now with the Mark II, the Zeta, and the Double Zeta. We're going to have a whole fucking Gundam crew. And I think, especially in the second half of the show on Earth, when they start having the Gundam team go out on their own individual missions, and you'll have episodes go by where Bright is back on the Argama, but we're not seeing him, and it's they are kind of their own self-sufficient unit. That is such a fun, cool dynamic and an evolution of what we've had so far, and... It's like hard to imagine a show where like you only had one Gundam because it's so fun having a team of people using them and kind of switching in and out because Rue will pilot the double Zeta sometimes, Judo will get in the regular Zeta, you'll have all different characters doing the Mark II, and then you have the Hyakushiki as like the cool outsider of the group. It's just fucking great. 
Yeah, and it is definitely, it's one thing that helps make that middle stretch of the show feel very different from the other Gundam shows because you have, here is, we've got a full squad. And, and all the members of the squad are unique characters with unique mobile suits because you would kind of have that sometimes in Zeta Gundam. But, like, as much as I like uh, Apolli, uh, Lieutenant Apolli, he's a cool guy, he's not much of a character and no. he's only piloting Rick Diaz. Whereas if you have the Hyakushiki, the Gundam Mark II, the Zeta Gundam, and the Double Zeta, they all are very distinct mobile suits with, like, distinct abilities. And so, like, they stand out really well in a fight and all feel like different characters. And so it does help it feel like this is not just a squad of mobile suits. This is, like, where we kind of put together this weird sort of, like, pseudo-elite team of Gundam pilots and Gundam kids in Gundam mobile suits um, to, to solve our problems. Yes, absolutely. We should talk about the Double Zeta itself, the title suit, which yes. I have yeah. to say, Sean, I thought the Zeta Gundam in, in Zeta was cool. I liked it, but it was always kind of overshadowed to me by the Gundam Mark II, which is just such a cool design. The Double Zeta is where it's fucking at. I love the Double Zeta Gundam. I love the whole that it's three pieces and they always have to do this fucking rad as shit transformation sequence where all of them come together. There's so many cool action moments they can do. It is so versatile as a as a vehicle for action because of all the different parts and all the different like suspense that you can build around like are they going to be able to connect it are they going to be able to do the dock that it involves different characters and then when it's all put together and just is there and it's this giant towering gundam that is like just kind of stupidly big i love it i think the double zeta is one of my favorite mobile suits in the whole series yeah the double zeta is just fucking massive um it, yeah it's it's crazy and i think my favorite like kind of dumb thing about the double zeta is the beam saber handles are huge like yes. they're so ridiculously big and not even just because the double zeta is big so everything on the double zeta is big i mean even relative to the size of the double zeta the fucking beam saber handles are gigantic and the double zeta has to like hold it with both hands and it's like this it looks like it should be like a Darth Maul style lightsaber, but it's but it's not. It just makes one gigantic fucking beam, and yeah, it, it's. I think one of the advantages of having a bunch of those different mobile suits is that I think the giant double Zeta would not work super well for me if it was the only Gundam in the show, like in Mobile Suit Gundam, or most of the time in Zeta, um, because it's so big and like kind of ridiculous looking. But having it be like, this is our kind of ace in the hole. It's like, a, it's not in, you know, the star of every single fight because we have all these other mobile suits. That is what allows the double Zeta and the transformation stuff for me to work really well in the show. Is that it doesn't, ever, not every single fight scene has to be pinned on the double Zeta and can it transform and all that stuff. It is able to kind of break out of some of those formulaic things because you have a whole Gundam team you can rely on. It's the first Gundam show, if I'm not mistaken where the title suit, once it's introduced, is regularly not in episodes. Like, there are yeah. plenty of episodes of Double Zeta where you never see the Double Zeta. In fact, I think this is the first time in the Gundam franchise so far where there's an episode. It's it's one of the ones in the Rasara arc later on where Haman is, is on the ship where there is no Gundam in an episode. It's the first Gundam episode with no Gundams in it because they, they are they, there's all those antique suits on that dude's right, establishment. Yes. Um, yeah. which that's probably my favorite of the Rossera episodes, A, because there's some cool as shit Haman Karn stuff in it, and they're piloting all these old ass suits, and it's just such a break from tradition, and also I was like, holy crap, nobody got in a Gundam in that episode, that's, and we're at episode, like, if you add them all up, 130 something, and, and there finally was an episode with no Gundam in it, um, so anyway, just, yeah, the suits are great, I love the Double Zeta so much, I definitely, there is a high grade Double Zeta kit that actually transforms and everything, Thing. So I'm going to have to build that at some point because it also looks like a fun challenge. Um, and I want to see it to scale next to like my Zaku and stuff. <laughs> yes, that is one of the great things. We'll talk about this again when we do Char's Counterattack. But the way that like mobile suits in that like the original Gundam, Zeta Gundam, Double Zeta, Char's Counterattack, they just get bigger and bigger. And it's one of the fun things about making the Gunpla is that you just get to see it's like, 
oh my god, the new Gundam is way bigger than the original Gundam. And it's like, the double Zeta is huge, but also, like, the Bawu is also gigantic. You yes. just don't know it because you don't see it next to a Zaku most of the time. But when you put them next to scale, they've just been slowly building, like, bigger and bigger and bigger mobile suits, which makes sense. But it's, yeah, it's it's one of the things that makes some of the double Zeta fun is just like, god, these things are massive. Yes. Like, the, the one that Pudu 2 has at the end, like the Kishitreya, or however you pronounce it, that one is just like, God, the thing's huge. Like, it's bigger than the Double Zeta. How the fuck are you making mobile suits this big? Oh, I love it so much. And also, I have to shout out, the eye-catch animation in Double Zeta Gundam is one of my favorite eye-catch animations in any anime ever. It is just that sexy as shit animation of the double zeta standing at like a cool angle with the stars behind it i have a i took a screenshot of that and made it my ipad wallpaper because the ipad has a 4-3 screen and it's just perfect and i just that image it is one of my favorite gundam illustrations i have seen so far i fucking adore that eye catch yeah yeah, it's very good. If you took that eye catch and put the sound from the original Gundam, our favorite, shoo, shoo, it would be, it would yeah. be the perfect eye catch. That would be the ultimate, like, god tier eye catch. 100% agreed. So, anyway, uh, talking about the heroes, I think while we're on the, the main heroes of the show, um, you, all, you have some, the, the returning, like, crew members from Zeta, like, um, Astonaji was in Zeta, right? Yeah, yes, my boy, the 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 ship engineer Astonaji. Yes. I love him. And then he the, doesn't like, he doesn't have a lot of character, but he's just he's got a very good character design. He's got a great name. Yes. I just love him like giving everybody shit for wrecking their mobile seeds. Oh, he's great. And then who's the guy on the bridge that is also a returning crew member? Um, there's a couple like there because they're kind of they're like the there's Taurus mm, is who I'm thinking. Yeah, about. Taurus. Yeah, they're like yeah. the marker and the yeah. other dude from the original show of, of Double Zeta and Zeta. But they have many more responsibilities this time because everybody else is dead. <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah. Everyone else died, so they're like, well, I guess we have to be like actual voiced characters now <laughs> instead of just like I'm the dude with like the blonde hair that you sometimes see at the controls in a shot in Zeta Gundam. And then of course we have to talk about my man Bright Noah. Who, the Gundam dad. The Gundam dad. We love Captain Bright. We've always loved Captain Bright. I think the best Captain Bright stuff is in Double Zeta. He's, he gets to be his truest Gundam dad self in Double Zeta. Like his, ex like, his exasperation at having to do this for a third time is so palpable. And I love it so much. And then his slow, like, just, like, becoming slowly resigned to this is, like, the world. That, like, I'm, like, he's the adult who knows that, like, He's too old for this shit, like, in a way that, like, he can't be the one who changes things. He just has to shepherd the next generation on, and they will be, like, Judo and his friends are the ones that will, like, create lasting change, hopefully. Um, that is not Bright's role in the world anymore, and he has accepted that in a way that the other adults have not yet. He is, I mean, I do want to have this conversation, maybe when we get to Shar's counterattack, maybe here, that Bright Noah is, without a doubt, the most pivotal figure of Universal Century Gundam. <laughs> Because yes. if he were not, like, he's not the dude out in the suit doing the heroics. But I have to imagine, if someone in the World of Gundam wrote history books 100 years later, he would be the most famous military figure because he was the captain of the pivotal crew for, th like, five different wars, right? Yeah, the, for the one-year war, the Grips conflict, and the first Neo-Zeon war, and the second Neo-Zeon war, <laughs> he was pivotal in solving every single one of those conflicts. He's also, like, he is, like, easily far and away the Gundam character to appear in the most episodes of Gundam. Yep. Like, nobody else is even fucking close. The only one, like, Char is probably the closest, but he's got, like, stretches of Mobile Suit Gundam he's not in. He's got stretches of Zeta he's not in. And he's not in a single episode of Double Zeta, nor is Amuro. Yeah. And Bright is in most episodes of all three of those shows. Oh, I know. Hirotaka Suzuoki is, like, in some ways the voice of Gundam. And I am very excited to move on to Unicorn Gundam is the next thing in my viewing order. Mm -hmm. But I know he's in that, and and Suzuoki was dead, and I'm, is 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 he in it a lot? Am I going to be very sad having to hear him? No, okay. no, yeah, he's got like he's I, from my memory, he's mostly like an expanded cameo. Like okay. he he doesn't directly interact with a lot of the main characters of Unicorn Gundam, okay. as far as I remember. Because just it it would it it broke my heart enough for the one line cameo at the end of the origin to hear someone other than Suzuoki do the voice, but mm -hmm. um. 
now that I've seen like most of the Captain Bright stuff, it's just like, oh, he is, he's the voice of Gundam in so many ways. Cause he's the guy who is just, he has a steady hand on the wheel. Right. And yeah. And he's, he's also the voice that like said the title of each episode for the original show. So like when you say he's the voice of Gundam, like that is literally true to me of yeah. like, I get disappointed when every anime does, doesn't just have him say the title of the episode <laughs> when it comes up because it's like, it's always great in the original Gundam. It's so great. And I, when I say that his best stuff is in Double Zeta, I think it's because Bright is a character who I think does have a pretty significant character arc. It's just always in the background. They're very smart about never putting Bright front and center because I don't think... Because Bright doesn't put himself front and center because he's a good commander who knows what his role is. But his evolution from the the kid, basically, in the original Gundam, who is trying to lead all these other kids who are slightly younger than him and trying to learn on the fly how to be a captain in this incredibly trying time, to the dude in Zeta who is, like, the most experienced man on the ship, right? Like, he is, yeah. like, the the, a, the AU was really, really lucky Bright Noah defected when he did, right? <laughs> because mm -hmm. they needed someone with that experience, and he steers the ship very well. And then into Double Zeta, where it's like, He's the last man standing, and if 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 he does not build a crew and and like inspire people the right way, humanity is kind of fucked. That is such a great evolution, and he is so well equipped for it by the time of Double Zeta, because I feel like he's learned so much, he's seen so much, and the way he starts interacting with these kids in such a vastly different way than he did with Amuro, than he did with Camille, than he did with at any other period where he realizes if we're gonna get through this. At, you, you said it earlier, Sean. You know, he's got to put his faith in the next generation. And he's got to know that he's, he will be... He's a, he's a dad. He will be there if they need him. He will give good instructions and mentorship. But he cannot steer the ship 100%. And in the end, he kind of has to let go. And that's one of his most, I think, heroic moments. Is when the kids realize, we've got to get the Nehru Argama away from the Love and Rose. And Bright is like... Yeah, you know what? I think they're right. And that's, I think, quietly one of his most heroic moments in all of Gundam. Yeah, it's him passing on the torch fully. And it's, like, such a cool thing that, other than, like, a couple of scenes where they cut away back to him, um, he's not in the last few episodes of Double Zeta because he has passed on the torch to the next generation. It's it's up to them. Although it's like, can you imagine... The... Sorry. Uh, yeah, well, can you imagine, like, how different Amuro would be if he had gotten this bright in the original show? Like, it's like, man, Amuro would just be such a happier person. Because uh, one of the reasons why Judo gets to be the person he is is because Bright is so much better at dealing with yeah. these kids than he was the last two times around. Particularly the first time around, where he was not good at dealing with Amuro fucking at all. Can you imagine how different the entire one-year war would have gone if the Bright from, let's say, Char's counterattack had body-swapped into his younger self? And just been like, okay, let's do this. And they would have wrapped that shit up so fast. Char would have been dead by episode two. <laughs> like, it'd be so over. Oh, but I have to read my... One of my favorite exchanges in the whole show is in the Nehru Argama episode where the Argama is leaving and, and one of the dudes on the Levian Rose is talking to Bright and he says, you've let your crew act like a bunch of kids. And Bright is like, eh, trying to get them to act otherwise was futile. I gave up. <laughs> And that is that is Bright Noah in a nutshell. And it's, there are, because Double Zeta, you know, Char's counterattack is the cap on top of everything, but Double Zeta really is the end of the trilogy. And there's so many great moments of, of cumulative impact like that, I feel like, mostly for mm -hmm. the world as a whole. But with Bright being our only character to carry through all three shows, I feel like there's some moments like that where you're just like, I love feeling it all come together. And then I did want to say, while he's not in the last two episodes a lot, he has three key scenes, two with Sela, which I think are two of my favorite scenes in all of Gundam. Just, they made the best use of Sela. They only had her for two scenes. They made the best use of her. And then uh, his last scene with Judo, where he, he allows Judo to like take his aggression out on him because again, Bright is the best space dad. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, gotta love Captain Bright. Also, I'm thinking about it because we talked about mentioned a few times there. I just want to also shout out um, continuing Gundam's tradition of just having the best s names for like space stuff, the like re the the repair ship called the Lavian Rose, which is just looks like a giant rose with all these like arms that are used for like different like docking stations, yep. is so good. It's like 
fucking peak fucking amazing Gundam names and concepts for ships. The Lavian Rose, two thumbs up. Every time it. they say it, I'm just like, fucking yes, it's so good. It's such a good spaceship name. Oh my god. It's so good, and it gets a really good final gasp in the anti-penultimate episode when it gets destroyed. Uh, yeah. it, it gets a great death. Um, as does Emery, the the captain of the Livian Rose by the end, who also worth interesting with, with Bright. Bright does get a little temptation in, uh, in Double Zeta with a woman who's like throwing herself at him. And he is a good husband, even if he's not always present because there's all these fucking wars. Uh, yeah. he, he does not give in to temptation. He's a good dude. Yeah. I also love the like utter ridiculous resistance that Gundam has of just calling her Emily because her name's just Emily and for whatever reason they refuse to romanize it as Emily instead it's E M A R Y it's like why her name is clearly just supposed to be Emily that's just it. it's just a normal person name and why I guess you, you can't just have you know you, you just can't have a normal person name in Gundam it's got to be Emery Hey, you know, why do you spell the last name Cello on Mashemeyer Cello with a C, thus making it look like Mashemeyer Cello, which is even better, but it's not actually his name? It's because they're, they're crazy geniuses, that's why. Emphasis on true. the crazy. Um, while we're talking about the heroes, let's talk about someone who becomes a hero, and then kind of a villain again, and then a hero, and that is L. P. Puru. Puru. Or as it's yeah, spelled in English... Kind of inconceivably, El Peo Ple, which makes no goddamn sense. I see where they got the... I did a whole thread on this because I had to investigate how the fuck they romanized it that way. And it, it, if you look at the source, it makes sense, but it also makes no sense that you would spell it that way. Yeah, there's like a weird sort of pseudo-pun thing going on with it. It doesn't matter. Cheese poodoo. We're yeah. not... No, Nobody should ever, ever call her Ple. It is insulting. Because it's just like the idea of if they had made like a full English dub of Double Zeta Gundam, the idea of her running around with her arms outstretched just going blah 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 <laughs> blah 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 blah. Right? It's like, no, it's supposed to be like cute and adorable. She's supposed to be it's like supposed to sound like a an airplane going pitty 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 pitty, you know, like puttering along. That's what her name's supposed to sound like. It's not pluh. I'm going to have God, to do an it's... edit, Sean, of your voice over Puru running around going, bleh, 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 bleh. <laughs> it's, it's like, I've just never seen a romanization of a name so completely change the feel of a name before then, bleh. And adding the O onto LP when it's like, there, it's just, there's a lot of bad stuff in that romanization. Um, Puru, I, I have so many thoughts on, and honestly, Sean, the thing I have been most excited to ask you is what are your thoughts on Puru, and what am I supposed to think about Puru? <laughs> yeah, so I think she's a great character. Um, I love Puru a lot. Like, she's definitely, she is, like, a prototype of the, like, sort of Emoto, like, little sister character um, in anime that's, like, definitely becomes way more of an issue later on for me. And so, like, there's, like, like, I don't ever feel like Pudu is particularly sexualized in Double Zeta Gundam, but she is definitely, like, one of the first examples of an archetype that becomes sexualized in, like, really problematic ways in later shows. Um, in later shows. Not later Gundam shows, necessarily. Like, later other anime stuff. Um, yeah, because Pudu is... Her role is obviously as this sort of, sort of, like, surrogate Lena, this surrogate little sister for Judo, and her... Her, like, fitting into, she's basically the Lala Soon slash four of Double Zeta. And the way that her relationship with Judo is so different than Lala and four. And again, in a way that, like, Judo is, like, the one who's able to deal with this the best. Deal with this weird, like, here's this, like, weird new type psychic girl who just acts in ways that are very strange because she perceives things completely different from anybody else, even Judo, because she's a much more potent new type than Judo is, particularly early on in the show. But he's like, he makes some mistakes with her early on, but he like slowly kind of figures out what like the boundaries between the two of them are and like the kind of like healthy big brother, little sister kind of relationship they foster. That by the time you get to the earth stuff, their relationship is so compelling. And I love that you have a big long stretch of the show where like the tragic you know, Amuro Lala's type pairing gets to be together and like friends and work together for a significant stretch of episodes before Pudu has to have her inevitable Gundam tragic death. 
um, that at least Judo is not the one that accidentally kills her. Like they they don't go full, they don't do the full cycle. They do a, an iteration on it, but well, it's a trap. That, it's a, that it's a for weird me death is what because Purdue it's is. kind of like a transition to a different plane of existence because she dies. But when Puru 2 has her moment near the end, it feels like her consciousness is still around, you know? Yeah, the, yeah, Puru is definitely the one where they go, they lean the hardest into the, like, new types become, like, psychic, like, their consciousnesses become, like, psychic entities that remain around and can communicate with people in, like, vague, yeah. like, weird supernatural kind of ways. Like, it, like, Pudu is definitely the one where they, which makes sense because you're, you know, going deeper into the new type stuff. She's the one that, like, goes the hardest into that, and it definitely she's the one that feels the most present after her death, partially because of, like, the new type ghost stuff, partially because Glimmy has made, like, a hundred different Poodoo clones because Glimmy is evil as shit, and Glimmy is, like, one of the most despicable Gundam villains. Um, but yeah, like, Poodoo is an interesting character that gets to, like, hang on to the show for a very long time while also getting, like, one of the more effective um, tragic deaths for me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm of two minds because my one mind is I agree with everything you just said, and I think Puru is... I, I love... I think she's an amazing character. I think the voice actress who voices her is fantastic. I think that the, the transition from her to Puru 2 and how Puru 2 is kind of a much more ruthless version of her who gradually comes to be more like the original Puru, um, the relationship with Judo and the rest of the team and how that all builds up, I think it's really sweet and well done. I just, and part of this is, I wish I could watch this without the 30 years of anime that came afterwards where this kind of archetype becomes super problematic and that's not in the back of my head. Do you know what I mean? Like, right, yeah. I, I can't watch it without knowing that that's where it all went. And I'm not saying it's anybody who worked on Double Zeta Gundam's fault, because to my knowledge, it's not. I don't know of any other Gundam show that does, you know, sexy little girl at any point, but... It's just, like, there's a, there's a couple of things I would say. It's it's that in Zeta Gundam, the cyber new type stuff is so explicitly sexualized. With 4 and with... Okay, yeah. Um, uh, the, the Rosamy. Other, yeah, Rosamy. And so it's, it's recalling that to me a little bit. And it is... So it's three things. It's that. It's that Glemmy Toto has something going on with little girls. And the show, like, like he kidnaps Lena and grooms her. It's, it's never explicitly sexual, but, like, we live in a world where men do this kind of thing, and it's usually not an innocent thing. Uh, and he has made a bunch of clones of a little girl, and I just don't know how we're ever supposed to think about that. And it is when they have scenes with Puru naked, I am uncomfortable about how pink the nipples are <laughs> and how much they are trying to draw your attention to that. There's just there's little things like that here and there that draws me out of it enough where I'm, like, I, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to be taking it. And yeah, I... for me, like, the nudity part, I think, is part of that, like, nudity was so, like, innocuous, you know? Like, like it, yeah, there is, like, nudity, but it's not, like, it's not heavily sexualized by the camera, right? No. Like, it's not, it's, especially if you, you know, eventually when we do fucking our Neon Genesis Evangelion podcast, we will have a very different discussion about this. But, like, the way that she is framed by the camera... And this is true of, of Gundam and Zeta Gundam as well. Like, there is a there is definitely a sexual quality to, like, there is more nudity for a couple of the female characters in those shows than you get for the male characters. But the nudity is also not presented in this super sexual way. No. Um, and so that part for me doesn't, never really bothered me that much because I think it's just, like, it's it's kind of shocking because you don't see nudity represented in anime, like, ever anymore like it just doesn't happen and so there's like a it big was much more common divide. when these shows were made it's worth pointing yeah out. like this is also the era of dragon ball having you know goku and gohan's little boy dick out every other episode you know exactly yeah it is just like it's it's that weird thing where you're not used to there being nudity depicted on screen that like is not being heavily commented on either like literally in like by dialogue and characters in the scene or that is like the camera and the visual direction like very heavily commenting on the fact that nudity exists in that moment whereas it's just like very casually like no this character is just topless because you know they're in the bathroom or whatever is happening you know like this character is walking out of this area where they don't have a shirt on and they just don't have a shirt on and it feels 
it feels weird because you're so not used to the fact that like, oh yeah, you can just depict naked people on screen sometimes and it doesn't have to be the camera zooms in and out and there's like a boy ring ring sound effect, you know, <laughs> like the most ridiculous shit that like if you watch some kind of anime today, you're like, why is this otherwise totally tame show all of a sudden getting like a thousand percent horny all of a sudden, like what is going on? It's it's so refreshing in a weird way. Not to say that again. It's not to excuse all this, and it is sexualized in some ways, and it is not like totally like equal across gendered characters. But it is relative to where most media is. It's like refreshing to be like, oh no, yeah, okay, yeah, that character is just sort of weirdly naked in this scene, whatever, and you move on. Yeah, I would say if I were to point to any one scene that overall saves like Pudu for me, and is what I would point to as like I think this is what the show is really going for with her. I think it's the episode after Lena dies, to our knowledge, dies. Yeah. Um, and Judo is super fucked up. He won't come out of the shuttle. He's very sad. And finally, he comes out, and he and Puru have a really lovely little moment together where he ends up just kind of curled up in her arms, like a, like a kind of very sibling-like embrace, and it's just being sad together. And I think it is such a beautifully tender moment of human connection and I think in the scope of things, that to me is who Puru is, is it is, it's not, it, there are ways you can read it in the context of anime where there's some sexualization going on. I think for the characters in this show, in the Digesis, there is no sexual connection going on there. It really is a sibling-esque love that builds between these two and a comfort that they find in each other because Puru needs someone who actually cares about her because she has been so horribly abused by Glemmy and by this whole cyber new type process. And Judo needs a little sister, kind of, because he is a caregiver. That's kind of how he's grown up. He is someone who's very protective. And, and finding that in each other is ultimately something that gives them both strength in the second half of the show. Um, and then I also think Puru is just, you know, fun and cute, cute in the, in the like, you know, fun sense of the word, like a, like a dog yeah. is cute, you know, um, and, and funny character who also I think has some really deep stuff going on. And as you say, a, uh, it's funny, her death did not make me sad in the way like Lala or Four's death did because it is done in such a metaphysical 2001-esque way like even judo does not seem to know what to think about it like what happened to puru no one reacts to it the way like amuro did to lala or something you know it is it feels much more like a transformation than a death um and i'm not saying any of this to put down this i love that scene i think that's what makes it so fascinating yeah. is it is so different um and overall i do think with the two purus that all feels like such a significant evolution of the cyber new type stuff from Zeta. I love how new it all feels and that they're really going off in a, in a new direction with it. Um, I, I, yeah, I think that's all phenomenally well done. Yeah. And it's also like, it's something where, where Char's counterattack has a similar sort of thing that we'll talk about, but the way that like the, the, the dichotomy between or the juxtaposition between Judo's relationship with Pudu and Glimmy's with Pudu, especially Glimmy's with Pudu 2, which is like the most like Glimmy, you know, like has his claws so deep into Pudu 2. Um, like that juxtaposition is one of those things that like helps you put into perspective, like the way that Judo is able to construct and maintain this like really healthy relationship um, with Pudu where like, they're where like like them being two people who are not related in of opposite gender and are heterosexual is not like a factor in their relationship is totally platonic whereas like glimmy even though glimmy never like directly states any sort of like sexual desire towards this towards lena or pudu like there is as you say that grooming quality to it that like he has this like controlling thing that he needs to make them in his image of like this is what like a proper young lady is supposed to be for lena and then this is what you are supposed to be as my weapon to pudu um and that like the way that glimmy sees these young women as tools and like things for him to create and shape versus judo sees them as people that he wants to help support and help them achieve what they want and that's what he wants for pudu is for her to be happy and successful in whatever it is that she's trying to do and like push her forward to be a better person like the way that that is contrasted is one of the things that helps make Pudu like she's one of my favorite characters in Gundam because I think she helps 
like put the themes and what Double Zeta is trying to do like so into focus with these two different versions of Pudu. Absolutely, and that's why I wanted to talk about her in some depth because I feel like to some degree your thoughts on Double Zeta do hinge on your thoughts on Pudu. She's so pivotal to the show. Like, yeah. to, to a large degree, the Pudu stretch of the show, which is also kind of the Earth stretch of the show, she's the co-lead at a certain point. Like, she is as prominent as Judo and more prominent than any of the other Shangri-La characters while she's around. Yeah. So, um, let's talk, transitioning to the villains, I want to talk about the other major cyber new type, which is Chara Soon, not Lala Soon. And the soon is spelled differently. Yes. It's, it's yeah. I'm, I'm going to call her uh, Kiara because that's how they pronounce it in Japanese. So it's that's, just like, yes. yeah. Because I don't know, like, what the intention for it to be pronounced in English. Like, it's spelled, because, you know, it's like character. It's it's a hard, I'm going to say it's a hard C. Okay. So, Kiara yeah. then, yes. Um, it's kind of like Makuve, where I don't think they fully grasped how um, certain Roman letters are, are spoken in the English language when they did the yeah. romanization. But anyway, uh, I don't know how I feel about Kiara is like my ultimate thought on her. There are episodes where I find her kind of interesting and there's episodes where I find it kind of insufferable. I do think it's a cool character design. It does kind of look like she's a Wonder Woman villain, but that's kind of fun. I, I like Kiara is like the like, and this is true of a lot of stuff in Double Zeta, but it's particularly her. She's like the most 80s character. Like it's like yes. 80s has come to Gundam. Um, I really like her because she's funny and also like I just love her vocal performance. Oh, it's a great um, yeah, the performance. Yeah, is great. Hazuki Monma, she like is not in a lot of anime and like I think one of the reasons why the performance is so compelling to me is because she's I don't think she was like traditionally like trained as a voice actress. I think she was more of like a singer and so she sounds like this weird like 80s hair metal lady. She really which does. Which is what she is. And so like she like it's a weird character, but they so, she embodies it so well. And it's like such a, like, I think like, I can see why you and like other people can find her annoying. And like, I definitely think like there's a fine line going back to like the sexualization stuff. This is like the most sexualized early Gundam gets is with Kara because she's, you know, she has large breasts and like, Although, in the scope of where anime goes, she actually doesn't. It's like, again, one of those culture shocks. If you're used to, like, watching modern anime, it's like, no, like, that's... Compared to other shit, that is totally not, like, that's just normal. Um, but, like, so, like, the show likes to play with that a little bit. But, again, it does not feel, like, so ridiculously heavily sexualized in the way that that, that kind of stuff can be and definitely would be later on. Uh, if, I think if, it if is in the, early, more it, in the early going when you have all the stuff with her in the mobile suits and like she's overcome and it's played, okay, yeah. it's played like she's in heat inside the mobile suits. Like it's, it's, it's like very animalistic and it's okay. Yeah. So there's, there's, I wanted, so I want to do a distinction there between the way she's acting in the mobile suit and then the way she is outside of the mobile suit. Like inside the mobile suit, she is sexualized, yes, but I feel by but they're doing it like on purpose, not to like, I mean, to sexualize the character, but not like for the pleasure of the audience. I think necessarily to like her being someone that is like intensely aroused by combat and being in like that confined space and feeling that. I I actually think that that dynamic of the character is interesting. There's something about like her just being so consumed by this weird sexual bloodlust um, that feels like it's some sort of component of her being a cyber new type character. Uh, there's something about that that I think is like an interesting, different, like, I don't know, it's hard for me to express like why it doesn't bother me, but there's something about it that doesn't feel like it is, it is not crossing a certain line and her just going fucking crazy. Um, I don't know, I'm into it. So I, I buy that. I think that's a very interesting interpretation. Yeah. I totally buy that that's there. I cannot help thinking of there is a... Do you ever watch Pro ZD's videos on YouTube? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, there's this one sketch he has where it's about... He's like commenting on an anime board. And he's like, I love this show, but this one character is, is like so overly sexualized. And then a, like an anime fanboy rushes in and is like, no, it's a commentary on how women are viewed in society. And, and there's an allusion to the Grapes of Wrath and the breastfeeding scene. And then it cuts to the author of the manga who's just like, uh, I just wanted to see titties. And I kind of thought that while you were saying that, I'm like... I totally buy that, Sean, that that's maybe in there. But I also think there's about 
12 different scenes over the course of Double Zeta Gundam where her breasts pop out and Judo gets shoved into them. And it just gets a little much to me because I think outside of that, I agree that Kiara is a really interesting character and her role particularly in the final batch of episodes where she is loyal to Haman, but also friendly to Judo and company is a really cool dynamic. It's not necessarily a repeat of anything Gundam has done before. And I think her final stand and her death and all of that is super well done. And I love her role in that last batch because she gets to go out with, I think, a lot of honor and dignity in a way that a lot of the cyber new types never got to. Um, and I think all of that's great. I just, there's a little less of the, I could use a little less of the fan servicey stuff. That's all. Sure. And I think, again, I think part of it is colored by, like, it feels so ridiculously tame compared to... Sure. Other st like, relative to other stuff, it's, like, so... Again, dude, like, I rewatched Neon Genesis Evangelion, like, two months ago. It's, like, Kerasune is not sexualized compared to what Eva does to its characters. And so, like, there's something... I think it, it's, for me, it's when it, the show allows it to be very playful... I don't really have a problem with it. And I think that's the thing with Kara is like, it's so playful and lighthearted about it that like the show has such a like positive feeling attitude towards that element of Kara's character. And so, you know, it's definitely, it's I'm not saying that it's not sexist because it is, but relative to what the show could be doing, it is, it is overall like not a, it's it's not hateful about the way that it's depicting her character. No, I um, yeah, I wouldn't. And ever there say are that. elements, yeah, and there are elements of it that I think like distinguish her in interesting ways, especially like in the era that she exists in within the '80s, and then within Gundam that has never done a character like that, and that Gundam very rarely ever does because Gundam is not aimed at like typically deliberately a very like an aged up demographic it's not a late night anime um almost all gundam shows air in kind of prime time slots so they're for more of a family audience and so gundam almost even past this point when anime becomes far more sexual um far more frequently uh gundam almost never kind of goes into this territory again and so there's something about kira just being like here's this like weird lady that like is sexual and she's just like fucking out about it and it's just like fucking yeah i'm gonna dye one half of my hair per blonde one half of my hair red i have this weird raspy voice and like i'm horny for mobile suits it's like okay cool <laughs> go for it lady like, i, live I your want best self. a poster on my wall of kiara soon that says i'm horny for mobile suits <laughs> yeah because that's what she is and it's like fucking if that's what you're into lady go for it yeah go for it uh I also, this makes me think of one other dynamic with Judo I wanted to mention, which is what differentiates him as a protagonist, is he is both very committed to and very good at saving people. And I think that's, yeah. and each protagonist gets better at this. But there are a lot of episodes of Double Zeta where Judo confronts people he does not want to kill and does not believe should be killed, and he does everything in his power to save them, and usually does. There's a whole episode in the, the desert arc, some, I forget which one it's called, it's like, I forget what it's called, but it's, it's um, where there is the bandits in the desert, and then there's this woman whose husband was killed in the war, and she goes out to like fight the Federation suits, and Judo just knows, like, there's no reason for us to fight. Killing you gets us nowhere, and I don't think you fully understand the conflict. And he does wind up saving that woman. When they re-encounter Kiara in the mines, he's very committed to, like, you were this woman who, like, we took you as a prisoner of war, but, like, you realized you were much happier not being made to fight as a weapon. We want to save you because you are our friend. And he never takes up arms against Kiara, really. Like, like he's very adamant yeah. about that. And, like, it's a long cry from in the original Gundam where Amuro... Amuro never wants to kill a lot of these people, but Amuro doesn't work that hard. Amuro slaughters so many people in the original show, like like in, in ways where I could imagine Judo in those scenarios finding a way around it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then also touching on that and like with Judo in, in Kyara, like one of the things I think that also makes it like I don't really have a problem with the way that Kyara is sexualized is also that Judo, Judo as a character never really sexualizes her. No. Like in his... He, like, especially if you think about, like, if Amro or Camille were in that situation and, like, with Kiara just sort of, like, being so kind of, like, openly affectionate, like, they would not, they would not handle that well at all, right? Like, no. Amro's thing with Matilda, because he saw a, a hot redhead lady that smiled at him once and he, like, carries this ridiculous torch for her. Um, Camille's whole thing with four and then, like, his sexual desire for her being, like, 
foisted on too far when he goes back into the space like both of them struggle with like sex in their lives in a way that like judo is this like very noble chaste older brother that is like man i don't have time for that shit like seriously dude i've got so much shit going on right now my sister has been kidnapped for like fucking months or something at this point i'm desperately trying to save her i do not have time to bother with that and it's like there's something about that that like is another element of judo i think is interesting that separates him from the other characters is he just doesn't let himself get distracted by being a dumb teenage boy he's just like yeah put that shit to the side man i got i got priority he prioritizes what is going on really really well he very much does so let's talk about the real villains i think there's a trio to talk about here from neo zeon and that would be haman karn gremi toto and my boy Masha Meyer Cello. I know it's Cello. I'm going to say Cello. It's so much better. Yeah. Um, we'll start with Masha Meyer because he matters the least. <laughs> but, Sean, I love Masha Meyer Cello so goddamn much. You have probably seen my ongoing Twitter thread where I just, I have enjoyed so much taking screenshots while I watch episodes of Masha Meyer's amazing face and his awesome purple hair and all the crazy things he says and his love affair with the rose that Haman Karn gave him and his sense of nobility. I think he is an amazing character. He is such a good foil for those early episodes as this very comic um, villain. And then he comes back in the second half of the show all glowed up because they've done horrible tests on him and that's very sad. But he is now this big, sexy, ripped dude who has one of the best deaths in Gundam, including his final line and the way the voice actor does it. Lady Haman Banzai! It's, it's, uh, it's so good. I love Mashemire, and also he has got an all-time Inner Circle Hall of Fame Gundam name. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mashemire like, he is, he is, man, like, because he is the thing that, to me, like, most makes that early section work, where he is, um just this ridiculous buffoon that is always having these like fantasies about lady haman um which are so great and like so not how those conversations went no he's looking that through very rose tinted glasses um yeah and in his sort of being this weird kind of noble hearted buffoon that is fighting for like the wrong side um but but like really wants to do well and and so his like all this stuff at side one where he's not trying to terrorize people like he wants to help people and it's like he thinks that that's what like neo zeon is here to do at side one um and then yeah, yeah then he leaves for a little bit and then and then he comes back and he's just all sexed up man he's just fucking ripped his sleeves are ripped off he's got like three buttons undone on his collar for like his like ripped fucking like man cleavage because his chest is just like pumped out and and yeah he's just so fucking he just he has gone places when they they full-on like cyberized him and and one thing i think is interesting that the show never like fully comments on or commits to and there's a similar like there's a similar kind of thing with glimmy um is like was he already a cyber new type of just in like a very like, were they already doing experiments on him by the first time we met him like is that one of the reasons why he has this weird Haman Karn thing is he already being brainwashed by that point or is it something that has happened between when we last saw him and him coming back all sexed up um yeah. it's something that the show leaves like as an open question that I always find very interesting of like how much of the real Mashimar did we ever meet and how much of this is like no he's like because he is super brainwashed like he's so seriously a cyber new type that he's like it explodes with his cyber new typeness and that is how he dies is they have gone so far with modifying him he literally can't control his powers to the point that he like basically combusts um i feel like that, yeah i find very interesting there must have been something going on the whole show because when they play their hand in his last episode and you learn that the rose is the conditioning thing. It's like the moment in the Manchurian Candidate when you find out yeah. like the Queen of Hearts is the card that is controlling him through the brainwashing. That the rose is such a thing for him throughout that like that's the thing about Mashemeyer is he is he is, I think, entertaining and magnetic in a way similar to how Shar is in the first half of the original Gundam, like through all of the uh um 
why am I forgetting the name of uh, Garma Zombie? Garma. All of the Garma yeah. stuff. Like, I think he has a very similar presence to Char in that way. I mean, he's less menacing because Char actually poses a threat and Mastermeyer emphatically does not pose a threat in those early episodes. But I think he has a similar entertainment value. And when he comes back, he's still very entertaining, but ultimately is a super tragic character because he has been abused so much. He has been so brainwashed. As you say, he liter literally explodes. And the one thing we thought we knew about him that he sincerely believed in and loved Haman Karn and like was fighting for a purpose is actually part of his conditioning. And the Rose is sort of all a trick. And then when he dies, Haman has the coldest of cold lines where she says, well, my tools available to me have gone down by one. And it's like... yeah. I feel like Mashemeyer is kind of double Zeta in a nutshell in terms of how he starts out very comic and lighthearted and ends up as one of the darker elements there and like heavier and thematically loaded. That's kind of what happens to a lot of double Zeta, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, because it is such an interesting structure of him, you know, being this buffoonish villain early on. And then, because you, th like, I remember the first time I watched double Zeta, I thought he was going to be like there with us for most of the show. But he's gone for like the entire middle stretch, and then and then he comes back, all sexy, but also all fucked up. Yep. But then you have Glemmy Toto, who is one of the greatest stealth characterizations Gundam does, because yes. you totally. I mean, I don't think it's just that like you accidentally thought Mashemeyer was going to be the villain, Sean. He's in the theme song for the first version of Anime Janai. He's in there with the other characters. Lemmy comes in as like this underling who is replacing him and is one of several villains in that post Shangri-La stretch who is kind of fighting for uh, fighting the Argama and none of them mm -hmm. feels like and there's ones in there who die and are one-offs and you don't know where like Grammy, Kiara, some of the other ones they do where they're going to shake out. There is no indication in those early episodes that Grammy is going to become the in many ways the big bad like even more than Haman Karn like he poses a greater threat in so many different ways um or yeah. if he doesn't pose a greater threat he is emphatically a worse person uh, than Haman Karn I think it's easy to say um and I think that evolution is so fascinating and he is one of the great Gundam characters in addition to being easily the most I think disgusting despicable antagonist the show has so far yeah, cause, and that is the thing about Glimmy is that the first time you meet him, you have no idea that he's going to be a really major character. And he, he Because he also feels a little bit buffoonish because you meet him um, and in that episode. It's all about him like becoming infatuated with Rue Luca. Um, also, like, A-plus Gundam name, Rue Luca. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Great name. Um, like, I get why he's, like, way into Rue because she is super cool. Um, she's got a very good custom pilot suit. Um, but yeah, so Glimmy, like, he has kind of, like, similar to Mashamar with, with Haman. He's got this weird infatuation with, uh, Rue. And then it's not until he, like, kind of kidnaps Lena and has her. And there's, like, every time you cut away to him and Lena, and it's like, what the fuck is Glimmy doing? And he's, like, giving her dresses and teaching her how to play the piano. And, and it gets so, like... Like, at first, he just seems, like, totally innocuous, and then as it builds up, you get to understand that it's like, oh, this guy is fucked up. Like, and he's a villain, not in the way that Char was in the first show, like, and not in the way that, like, the Zobbies are, not in the way that Haman Karn is, who she's basically, like, a Zob, like, a Cassilia Zobby of this show. Um, and, like, she, he's probably most equivalent to Paptimus, but even he's, like... He feels like he has more, like, weirdly noble goals in his own way than Glimmy does. Like, Glimmy's so, like, just fucked in his way of just trying to control all these people around him, particularly these young women like Lena and, and Pudu, and him literally manufacturing, like, 100 Pudus for him um, as his, like, manufactured cyber new type army. Like, he takes the like the cyber new type thing to its most disgusting conclusion where it's not just you twisting people um, through your experiments, but you're literally manufacturing people now to, to be your slaves. But then he's also, he's so, so sure that he's right. And maybe that's the thing that separates him from someone like, like uh, Shiroko, where you feel like Shiroko understands that like morality is in some ways a little bit relative and that other people have like legitimate points of view like Shidako definitely is not a good guy but he's not in like 
kind of an idiot in some ways. And Glimmy is an idiot in all the worst ways possible, where he thinks that, like, he is, like, born to lead the Neo Zeons, that he is, like, basically, like, some sort of, you know, like, messiah like figure at some point, that he is going to succeed the Zobbies, take over up in Haman Karin and that everyone is going to love him because he's going to be the one that's going to lead us to a bright and wonderful future. And that way that he has just grown into this utterly disgusting um, ideology and you see him along the way in his journey on earth and the way that him like being spurned by Rue sort of drives him deeper into it. Like there's definitely a lot of like modern alt-right um, kind of incel almost qualities to him as well. Um, that just pushes him to this place that by the time you get to the end, he, like, I have never been more happy to see a villain get utterly fucking vaporized than Glimmy Toto. Like, you just want this guy to be gone immediately. And I think it's a really interesting dynamic in Double Zeta that you have one of the most charismatic and entertaining villains in the history of Gundam in Haman Karn. And they are, they are willing for the service of the story and for larger points. I wouldn't say they sideline her in that, like, she disappears or anything. But the big bad of the final episodes is much more glemmy. Like, the, the final yeah. standoff in terms of where I feel like the climax of the show is, it's with Glemmy, it's not with Haman. By the time Judo faces down Haman, like, Neo Zeon's done. She's, she's fucked. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no future. It's, it's almost like a formality and judo wants to go out and do it because he feels like he kind of owes it to her as his enemy it's like it's like a kind of an old like honor system sort of thing going on there yeah. with glemmy it's like this dude is is bad news in a way even haman karn isn't because haman karn is actually fighting for something and is logical and smart and you know these sorts of things and i think it, there is some i do think there is something good very 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 deep down in haman karn i don't think there is any humanity in glemmy toto and that they give him and Judo the big moment of the big standoff they have and the exchange of philosophical viewpoints says so much. And then he gets one of the most, as you say, satisfying villain deaths where um, Judo talks him, talks, not doesn't talk him down, but is like, like having his verbal standoff. Puru 2 jumps over and Rue, who has been like, is downed in the Zeta Gundam, just raises the beam rifle and just vaporizes him it is such it's such an old it's like an old west standoff but instead of like gun from the hip fire hit them in the stomach it's gun from the hip fire and he's a little tiny human on top of a mobile suit and he just blows to smithereens yeah it's great it's such an earned death um and you just god he's just fucking glimmy toto god he's just he's so He's so evil, and and it is definitely, like, I think what makes him work so well is having that middle stretch where he is, like, that's where he's the most, like, Char-like in a, like, pseudo-co-protagonist role, where you cut to him in the desert, and he's going through all of his stuff with the blue team and all that, and you see how he ends up, like, getting these kind of delusions of grandeur um, that, that coincide with his most kind of, like, sadistic, gross, like, sort of misogynistic tendencies, and they kind of dovetail together to create just one of my most like hated anime villains but in a way that is like like for the show is really good like it's exceptionally well executed on um what they do with glimmy oh, and and absolutely. i'm glad that he doesn't get i'm glad that he gets killed in the penultimate episode because i don't want him to have like the satisfaction of being the one who like gets to close out the whole show i'm glad he's like dead for a whole episode because fuck that guy absolutely which brings us to sean our glorious, wonderful space queen, Haman Karn. Would you like the honors of talking about why she is our glorious, wonderful space queen? Oh my god. I mean, so first off, we just have to start with the fact that, you know, while Jim Burrell still holds the, the trophy for, like, funniest Gundam name, the coolest Gundam name in all of Gundam is Haman Karn. And especially how you say it in Japanese because they basically it feels like they scientifically engineered a name in Japanese that cannot be said without there being like intense awe and fear infused into the word like you can't just casually say oh what's up Haman Khan like you just can't do it every time you look at it it's just like Haman Khan and you just you gotta you gotta put 100% Come on, you know, you have to get all of that in there. Also, um, you can never say just one of her names. It is Haman Karn. 
You can never yeah. go Haman. Maybe you can go Haman Sama, but you have to say Haman Karn. Yeah, and it's like the only thing that I'm the only real way I'm bummed about Char not being in Double Zeta because I think generally it was the right choice to make is that we don't get more Suichi Keita just going Haman Khan because he was the best at saying her name. Um, <laughs> Judo's very good at it also, but yeah, so she's just so so fucking cool and the way that you i think it's so smart the way they use her in double zeta of um one i think it's right not to have her be like the main villain necessarily like i definitely think the primary antagonist is glimmy glimmy is the one that pairs off with judo the most cleanly he's the one that like is like that kind of the dark twisted version in his relationship with pudu and all of that like he is definitely the focal antagonist um and the one that is most thematic resonant in double zeta but Haman Karn's role of, one, being in the background for the whole opening section of the show where you know that she is present because you have Mashima talking about her all the time. Like when Kyoto comes in, she's talking about her and the fact that Haman Karn sent her down. Um, like Glimmy is constantly, like everyone is, especially on the Neo Zeon side, are obsessed with Haman because she has got such a tight grip on Neo Zeon and that power because she is the lady that won Zeta Gundam. Like everybody else lost that conflict. The Titans were destroyed. The Earth Federation government is sent into like utter like inadequacies and, and corruption. The AU is almost completely dismantled. The Argama and like a couple of other ships are the only ones left. And Haman Karn has now come in and taken over with Neo Zeon and the show it's her like slowly trying like, you know, bending the Earth Federation to her will um, like whining and dining them and like kind of exploiting them for like the corrupt rats that they are. Um, and it's the way that she just sort of completely owns the fact that she's a dictator. Like, she doesn't give a shit. She's not, she doesn't like, she's not give, like standing up giving these big like, you know, Nazi-esque speeches like Giren Zabi. She's not professing this like direct ideology in any way. Like in, in, in a way that like, I feel like, come on Karn, doesn't care. I don't think she has like an ideology like Char or Giren does. She just wants power because she thinks that she's the baddest bitch around and she's 100% right about that. And it's like, would a world ruled by Haman Karn be the best of all plausible worlds? No. Compared to like most of the people vying for power in Gundam, would I like Haman Karn to have it? Generally, yes, because I feel like she's not trying to fuck with people. She just wants to stand on top of the hill and look down on all the peasants around her because she's better than anybody else in the world. And that is 100% true. And and that's like Haman Karn's path in this show is you see her as like the one alone standing on the mountain. She has no friends. She has no confidants. There's like, you know, she has no real relationships with anybody because she like she's almost like a Sith Lord or something. It's like her and her alone. Like she wants all the power for herself and everybody else to be beneath her. Um, and when we're first introduced to her proper, when Judo like stumbles into her room, when he's infiltrating Axis, I love that you see that she's just like in, in the glory of her power. She has just made it so that Axis is and at summertime all year round. We don't have seasons anymore because Lady Haman loves summer and she's just fucking sunbathing in her like lavish palace because with her hair down, which I also love the revelation that like her hair is not just that way naturally. She has to like poof the hair out and like do the whole weird space hair thing. Um, but normally it's just like, she's just got normal purple hair. Um, and she's just lounging around, having a good time, like enjoying the power that she has won for herself. And there's something so just like pure about Haman Karn and what she wants from the world and her ability to just attain it that I adore so much. And it's the reason why she is my, she is forever my space queen. Like, yes, thank you, Haman Sama. I will follow you to, to death. I mean, you said this on our Zeta Gundam episode that like, you know, Haman Karn would be bad for the world, but if she asked you to do something, you would follow her to the ends of the earth. And I thought, yeah. having just seen Zeta, I'm like, oh man, that was a pretty extreme thing for Sean to say. And then I think about halfway through double Zeta, Sean, I, I reach the exact same point where I'm like, it is the combination of, as you say, the name, which is just incredible. Uh, the, the character design, which is one of the best character designs in Gundam. Just the hair and the face and the dress. It's so perfect. She looks like an evil Miyazaki protagonist. I don't know how uh -huh. else to say that. But like the, the, the dress, she looks like if Kiki from Kiki's Delivery Service grew up, got purple hair and became evil. <laughs> like that's what she looks like. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> and it's such an amazing design. And then I think the vocal performance, I'm forgetting the name of the actress right now, but it is such a phenomenal vocal performance. It's, it's like you suddenly understand everyone who's ever fallen under the spell of a cult leader. You know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. okay, you know what? We're all human. I'm not going to judge anymore because if Haman Karn came around and asked me to swear fealty to Neo Zeon and then go die in a mobile suit for her, I'd fucking do it and I'd die happy. I would sniff that rose and I would put it in my lapel and I would be a happy man because I would be serving my glorious space queen. Um, th like... For the character to work, all of that has to be sold to the audience so perfectly, and they really pull it off. And it is an amazing achievement. You know, uh, when we got out of Zeta Gundam, I kind of wondered if Gundam was ever going to be able to match the group of antagonists that are in the original show between Shar and all the zombies, because those are such great, towering villains. And I thought Zeta, no individual villain like rose to that level for me like i think zeta is more about the quantity of villains than like the i'm not saying quality that they gave up on quality i just think like it's a show where purposefully the the political situation is the villain in zeta gundam not so much any one individual actor and i think yeah. that's very purposeful because when you get to zeta double zeta you're like oh okay they're perfectly good at coming up with great villains. They could do this till the cows come home because Haman Karn, as she is fully developed in Double Zeta, I think is every bit the equal of a Shar or a Giren Zabi or something like that, right? Or or certainly a Kaecilia, which she very much is like Kaecilia 2.0 in a lot of ways, I think. Um, yeah. And I think between her and Glemmy and Mashamire, you're like, okay, these are totally the same guys who made the original Gundam and they can make lots and lots of great villains. Um, and she is near the top of the pile. I feel like she and Char are holding hands at the top of the, at least the original stretch of Gundam, like, like villain roster, you know? Yeah, they're holding hands, and then behind their back, they both have, like, a knife because they're about to try to kill each other because <laughs> exactly. that, that's how Char and Haman do. Yeah. I, it's, I mean, yeah, she and Char are so similar in so many ways. You feel like, you know, they would get along if their egos were just a tad smaller. <laughs> Yeah, the, like they, they're if if their egos were a tad smaller, but as they are now, they would just fucking murder each other on sight. As they oh tried God, to Haman. do every single time they met in Zeta Gundam. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, Haman is the other half of the greatest Char moment of all time, where she's like, "Aha! You like finally reveal you have betrayed us, Char," and he's like, "I've never betrayed anyone in my life, Haman Karn." It's like fucking a these two people. I, oh uh, my god! I have to say, there. Uh, I just found these a couple weeks ago. There is a full fan translation online of the Shars Deleted Affair manga, which is the fourteen volume manga that is the true prequel to Zeta Gundam, more so than like Stardust Memory, because it's the the middle portion between. 0080 and 0087 and apparently Haman is a huge character in that and her relationship with yeah. Char um, and I am they're very high quality fan scans and I have downloaded them all and I'm very excited to read them because that sounds like an exciting story and um, I do not think it's wrong to download fan translations when the manga has not been officially released in English so yeah no yeah if they release it in like... English I will buy it for now there is no way for me to buy that in English. So there you go. Yeah. But I'm excited to read that because I wanted I want more of Haman and Shar together. Um, while we're on that subject with Haman, I also think it's really cool what they do with her and Judo through the show. That it's yeah. so smart of them to give her a relationship with one of the characters. Because in Zeta, her only real relationship with the protagonists is with Shar. And that's a pre-existing relationship. So we come into Double Zeta and Haman is pretty distant to us. And I think giving her this relationship where Judo, I think Judo kind of empathizes with her at a certain level. But because they're both new types, because they're in contact, and he ultimately gets to defeat her feeling a sort of pity. And I think coming around to that point in the journey of Haman Karn being such a towering figure, but for Judo, she's very human, is one of the brilliant strokes of this show. Yeah, I love their relationship so much and like they're the handful of like really pivotal scenes they have like judo stumbling upon her sunbathing in the balcony it's just such a good fucking amazing moment um but then especially when they encounter each other again in lena's blood where haman shoots lena and and that's when like judo that's when it feels like judo is kind of fully activated as a new type they like kind of gives away like to these incredibly intense emotions and she like for the first time in her life it seems like she has encountered somebody else that is as powerful as her in like a new type way because she is so like colossally more powerful than most other people in that sense like she you know she's like more powerful than camille was right and camille was 
he knew his shit. He was good at that stuff. Um, so when when she kind of gets that like judo's version of what Dozel Zabi did at the end of the Solomon battle when he's standing on top of the big Zam fucking shooting at the Gundam and just a demon rises up, judo does that to her, and it's the first time we have ever seen um, Haman Karn feel anything other than just like true pure superiority over everybody else in the world which is what her your like constant emotion in her demeanor and she is afraid for like the first time probably not the first time in her life but the first time we have ever seen that side of her that's like oh yeah no of course she's human of course when like she's like being psychically attacked by this this guy that it's going to affect her she's not immune she's not immortal she's not perfect um she just creates that she cultivates that image for herself because it's one of the ways that she maintains her power and Judo is like one of the only people that can kind of see through those cracks and understand that like Haman Karn is a human too. And it's like, it, you know, probably sucks to be so much, one, so much more capable than anybody else because Haman Karn is on top of her shit. Like so much more powerful than anybody else in that kind of new type kind of psychic sense. But, and then, and then more powerful than anybody else politically because she's also way smarter than anybody. She has like manufactured this entire Neo Zeon situation to allow herself to be like the Richelieu behind the throne that, you know, controls Mineva. She is at the top of the hill and it's lonely at the top of the hill. And the only person that we ever see that kind of like recognizes that fact is Judo because he's the only one that can see that side of her intuitively as a new type. And so their like combative relationship where judo kind of sees that like you know not that haman karn probably could ever be like a good person in that like she's not going to be ever like compassionate and empathetic towards people i don't think she has it in her but like judo sees this like there's not it's not hopeless for you like you know you could maybe be a happy person if you let yourself be um and then haman karn i think seeing in judo this like power that she doesn't quite possess and she wants to possess that and so she's trying to bring judo to her side so that she can have him and control him and have him under her and like beneath her like she wants everything to be like that dynamic is so compelling and what makes like while their duel at the end of double zeta is not like the high point of the show which is i think the confrontation between glemmy and judo it is this like really powerful somber denouement that like brings the sort of that relationship and the show to a close is this duel where you kind of for me at least like i don't want either of them to die i do want them to kind of like resolve some sort of weird unresolvable difference between the two of them and have them be able to coexist because you like both of them so much despite the fact that haman karn is definitely not a good person but i want her to to change i want her to find something that could make her happy and that just is not in the cards and so there's something tr so tragic about their relationship of not being able to sort of resolve those differences between the two of them i agree and i also want to mention how <clears throat> amazingly well choreographed that final fight is it is yeah. one of the best animated fights in gundam you have them in this basically you know exploding space colony because they're in that side three colony that she had that is now going to hell and there's the whole thing where he's he, they're fighting and she's kind of getting the upper hand. So Judo starts disassembling the double Zeta until yeah. he's just down to the core fighter. And then they both get out of the cockpit and then they're back in. And he reassembles with all of the like new type power fed to him by Camille and everybody else and, and gets her. And then she, of course, then this is the perfect Haman Karn death. Haman does not allow anyone else to take her out. She takes herself out. She commits suicide because no one else is good enough to defeat Haman Karn. Yeah, and, and their final exchange where Judo just sort of like yells at her, like with all the power you have, you would have been able to save the earth. You know, like like with what you have been able to do, what, with what you've accomplished, like if you used it the way that like someone like Judo would have used it, she could have solved all of these problems. And Haman just like laughs in his face at that. It's like, that's not what I want. That's not what anybody wants like you prevented me from killing everybody on earth which is basically what i was trying to do i wanted to murder all those motherfuckers because they suck yeah. um and that like and and she and there's that it's that repeating thing where charge kind of attack talks about this line a lot too of uh, the way that people's souls are like bound to the gravity of the earth that like we because we're bound to earth we're not truly able to fly and so she says like you know because i rewatched this scene earlier today because i love it so much that you know, once humanity got out to the asteroid belt, we keep on coming back. That we've never gone, like, in so far in Gundam, like, we're not going out much further than that. 
and we keep on being pulled back to Earth. We're not going out and colonizing beyond the Earth sphere proper um, because we're still bound to the Earth. And it feels like Haman resents that in a lot of ways. But then her last line is that she's glad to have she is she's glad to have come home because she has met someone else who is strong. Basically, she's met like a child who is strong is like the literal line she says. And that sense of like her like acceptance at the very end that she has met somebody else that is maybe as powerful as she is in judo. Somebody else that like has access to what she kind of had access to. She's glad that she could see someone else that was maybe could be on her level the, like before she died. And like that's the thing that maybe she was looking for was someone else that could compete with her because she's so much cooler than anybody else in the world. It's lonely at the top, you know? Exactly. It's especially when you're as glorious as Haman Sama is because she is fucking... Oh my god, she's so cool. To quote Masha Meyer Sama, Haman, or Masha Meyer uh, Cello, uh, Haman Sama Banzai. Banzai. <laughs> Banzai yeah. indeed. All right. Uh, for the last topic, I think, on this episode, Sean, I think we should talk about the stretch in Dublin where we get. Oh, yeah. Where we get a colony drop, we get the death of Hayato. Fucking tell me no, you oh motherfucker. God, yeah. And we get the return of Camille and Fa. Fa, who. I liked Fa a lot in Zeta Gundam. I think she's a really good character. Fa becomes one of my favorite characters in Double Zeta. She's not in it a ton. She's in the first 10 episodes. And I know that because episode 10 is called Sayonara Fa. And then yeah. she is in the Dublin stretch and she appears at the end. And I think Fa just... Especially when like she is now in more of a leadership role where like she is a mentor to the kids at Shangri-La in the first stretch. She is the one taking care of Camille and she's dealing with just a lot of bullshit. I think she really comes into her own as a character and as a person. Um, I think all the stuff with Camille is fascinating. And I like how they let that character move forward without, I think, reversing or rewriting the tragedy that is Camille. Um, they still mm -hmm. continually leave it ambiguous near the end, even though he's clearly getting better. Um, and then all the stuff in Dublin, like, it's... The, the sheer horror of how they do the colony drop and the episode after the colony drop, which I think might be the best animated episode of Gundam that I've seen, yeah. um, is all... It's an, it's an incredible stretch of the show. And I know it's one you were very excited for me to see because you hinted at it several times. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's like... Because I love all the Earth stuff um, in Doubles Data a lot, but it is especially the Dublin stuff, which is the end of that, that Earth section, is like... Four episodes, Dublin Afternoon, Camille's Voice, Falling Sky, and Prisoner of Gravity, Pudu 2. All just like A-plus titles also for Gundam episodes. Um, but yeah, like th that whole stretch in Dublin, uh, them meeting Camille again. That's also where um, Judo, is, like like where Bright goes to meet a bunch of Federation officials and Judo finds out about it and goes and like kind of eavesdrop on their meeting and like finds out that they're all corrupt motherfuckers and he just jumps up on their table and like kicks their shit around and just yells at them because they're like corrupt adults and it's like Judo's tired of dealing with this bullshit and then they get locked in the basement and that's when Fa comes back in. It's like that whole section is also like a, like a great like top 10 Judo moments of just not taking anyone's bullshit. I'm just like, I'm just going to stomp on your tea set motherfucker because you're sitting here on earth drinking tea while people are dying everywhere and they're going to drop a goddamn colony on this planet. Um... But yes, it's particularly that that well that the stretch of them having to go find Camille who has gone missing, um, and and Judo's like getting these like Judo and the Pudu getting like these new type kind of messages from Camille trying to find him, and that has one of my favorite episode endings where Camille is sitting on like on these rocks by the sea, just staring out at the ocean, and that's when um, the conclusion song from Zeta Gundam, that's the the instrumental version of the second. Uh, Zeta theme plays again, which is just so gorgeous and like brings up all these emotions. That's a great moment, but it's especially then them fighting, um, like the colony drop is going to happen. They're all fighting. Um, and it's one of the, it's the only other time I think that Gundam kind of recaptures the magic of the Lala Soon fight of a cosmic glow when Lala dies. 
um, of just this frenetic energy where so many things are happening at the same time, where Judo and the Gundam team need to pull back and get back to the Argama, but they want to save every last person they possibly can before, like, the entirety of Ireland and probably, like, the rest of the UK as well are just literally completely destroyed, not even mentioning, like, the environmental, like, death that's going to creep across the entire globe from the colony drop. So they're trying to, like, get anybody they can save, and Judo's, like, in the middle of this fight, and then all of a sudden... The colony touches the like like breaks through the clouds and touches the ground, and then there's just like a two minute section of like every single character turning and looking at the colony as it impacts the earth and like freeze framing as everyone realizes like the the enormity of what has just occurred, which is just like maybe the best ending to any Gundam episode because it's like fucking crazy, and then the next episode is just complete chaos where the like. The fucking, like, clouds are breaking apart. Ash is just strewn everywhere. Everything is on fire. Just tidal waves all over the place. People are being just, like, con like mobile suits are being swept up in the winds, in the water. Um, and the, the, the colony is just collapsing into the earth as it breaks apart from the impact. And then that's when Pudu 2 comes in. And then in Pudu and Judo have to fight Pudu 2 around the wreckage of the colony yeah. as ash rains down from above and then and then like and then you're cutting to camille and fa who have gotten away on a plane as camille is running to where um like you can see in the distance and like uh, where the colony is hit and the black just like fucking mordor clouds emanate from it it's it is i think like one of the most visually interesting episodes in the history of gundam it's one of the most like just fascinatingly directed like frenetic um, engaging episodes of Gundam that they've ever made, and and like that that is the one that like made my jaw drop. In that when I finished Double Zeta, like that was one of the episodes I hung my hat on on my original assessment of this show was better than Zeta Gundam, which like I now like kind of probably Zeta I think is a little bit better overall, but they're more even for me. But like fucking that everything to do with that Colony drop, I cannot believe how well they executed on that. As for a thing that like. If you've been watching, you know, since the beginning with Mobile Suit Gundam, you have constantly been imagining what does a colony drop like really look like? Like, what is that experience like? Because that is one of the first things. It's like the third sentence you ever hear in Gundam is they dropped a colony on Earth and half the population died. Um, what does that actually look like? And for the episode to like not just deliver on your imagination, but to overcome like the, the just like the pandemonium that your imagination creates at the idea of a colony drop uh, is just a truly phenomenal achievement. 100%. And that episode, Puru 2's Descent, that you just described. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it is the most ambitious, visually ambitious episode of anime I've ever seen. Like, yeah. I cannot think of an episode from another anime TV show that bites off more and succeeds as beautifully as it does. Like, that is a full-on movie-quality 20 minutes of animation. You could throw that sucker in a theater and no one would bat an eye. I have seen plenty of anime movies released for theaters that do not look as good as that episode of TV. It is insane yeah. what they attempt to pull off and what they do. And that, you know, this was done in 1986, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And then... Gundam The Origin, the episode where they do the colony drop, the original colony drop, that was made in, what, 2017, 2018, very recently. And yeah. they do a phenomenal job with it. I'm not sure they do a better job. Like, I think the colony drop in Double Zeta is even better in, in how ambitious and well pulled off it is because it is so ground level. Um, and that's amazing because obviously they have so many more tools and The Origin was obviously higher budget. It's basically a theatrical OVA series. So, like... That's crazy to me how much they pull off. That, that I agree. The four-episode Dublin stretch is probably the height of Z Double Zeta. I'd also point out the... Um... Oh, well, my Siri just went off. That's what you... If you heard a voice on there, Siri thought I, I told it something when I was talking about Dublin, I guess. Anyway, what was I saying? Um... Another stretch oh, yeah. that you like? Yeah, so the, the, that main four stretch, which I think... Gun to my head, Puru 2's Descent is the best episode of Double Zeta. I would also say Lena's Blood Parts 1 and 2 are near the top. Yeah. And then the um, penultimate episode of Vibration. I think those together would be like the top four or five episodes. Um, Agreed. And yeah, Puru 2's Descent. Just, even if you have like no interest in Gundam, 
just bring that episode up and watch it on mute if you want to see some of the most haunting, beautiful artwork I think Japanese animation has ever produced. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah, because that's also the episode where the Psycho Gundam, like, you could, like, it's, like, gets terminated, basically, where, like, the, the casing of the Psycho Gundam gets blasted yep. off. It is just, you see the, like, the raw machine underneath it, which is um, a visual that I'm surprised that, like, Gundam doesn't do more of. Like, they do it sometimes, but that feels like that's, like, a it's such a good shot um like just kind of like ripping apart the facade of what these things are that, that they like look like people in this and like they're just these like war machines underneath um yeah it's it's incredible like that episode is just a color palette of it and the like the ash um like the black and gray ash that just permeates every single shot it's got like a kind of almost like kurosawa element to it of the way that he would use rain you know like the the climax of seven samurai or or, or uh ikidu and stuff like that um it's got that kind of visual quality quality to it that is um probably a massive pain in the ass to do an animation because it means you have a lot of different details you have to put into every single shot in the background it's um, pretty clearly a, it's I think what it is is it's a cell plate on top where they've animated a bunch of ash and it's probably a pretty small set of ash layers that they have repeated over frames but it is still really well that means you're having probably four or five layers of animation when you do background the ash layer and then the character cells so you've got at least three probably another fourth for all the special effects going on with smoke and stuff um but yeah it's it's crazy ambitious yeah, it's clearly an episode that, like, they, like, blocked out on their production schedule of, like, we're going to put all of our top guys on this one. Like, we're going to make sure this is going to be one of the big budget ones. Like, let's make sure we do that one right. <laughs> because, yeah. because we're biting off a lot uh, with, with what that episode is asking us to do. What do you think of uh, the, the death of Hayato? Oh, my God. My, my, our other Gundam dad, Hayato. Yeah, it's so sad. It's like it's you know is one thing i'm so glad i'm just so glad that we never have to see the scene where fraubo finds out that cats and hayato died like i'm glad that that just is not out there because i don't want to see it i don't want i don't want to see fraubo learn about like i don't want to see that letter go home right like i just don't want it because it's too sad oh see i was Fucking... gonna say if i have one complaint because hayato dies for the shangri-la kids and they only sort of know him from this one mission they've done together I kind of, because Hayato stretches all the way back to the original, I wanted the cutaway somewhere in the in this episode or a later batch where Fraubo and uh, Kika and Let's have to react to it. I I kind of wanted that somewhere in Double Zeta, but you're also probably... I don't probably think I could emotionally handle it. Yeah, I don't, it I would just be hard. Can't. It would be really it's, hard. It's the same thing of, like, thinking about, you know, in the book that Amuro dies when, at, like, a 16-year-old. Like, I can't... I can't deal with like I'm like I could maybe read it I don't want to see it I don't want to have Toto Fudia perform it I don't want that in my life I could not handle that emotionally like I'm fine with that just being that obviously you know it's out there like this is like Amuro dies in that version of the story at some point Fraubo finds out that her husband is dead and one of her adoptive uh, children are dead I don't want to see her have to find that out Poor Fraubo, which uh, is yeah. it was a true sentence in the first episode of Weekly Suit Gundam. It's a true sentence here in our eighth episode of Weekly Suit Gundam. Anything else to say about Double Zeta before we call it a day, Sean? Double Zeta is really good. Uh, like if you know, I it, it hurts me to know that there are Gundam so-called Gundam fans who have not seen Double Zeta, who have seen like the original show. Maybe they're, maybe they're probably the kind of person that watched the movies instead of watching the original show. It's like, fuck off. Just watch the show and then watch the movies. Um, but they watched, you know, they got the original Mobile Suit Gundam and then Zeta, and they skipped it to go to Char's Counterattack. And it's like, what the fuck are you doing? I also Double think... Double Zeta is so unbelievably good and is, like, a necessary part of the whole... Like, it fits in. Like, you, if you don't have that, I don't understand how you i don't understand how you leave that hanging because there's so much thematic material that double zeta resolves that the idea that you wouldn't watch it is utterly absurd to me i also think having just watched shars counterattack i don't think shars counterattack is anywhere near as rich a movie if you haven't seen double zeta because just because yeah. Shar isn't in double zeta i think his specter is like there's the scene with sayla in the final episode where she and bright talk about Shar. um 
and I think he is sort of there in spirit, and so is Amaro, and they are reacting to a post double Zeta world. And in fact, there's a yeah. there's a scene just as a preview for our Shara's counterattack discussion. There is the scene at the end of the finale of Double Zeta where Judo is reacting to all of the carnage he has seen in these forty seven episodes, and and Captain Bright he says like all of this for these assholes who live on Earth and won't give it to anybody else. Why why are so many dying for this? And Captain Bright says. You know, I'm sorry. It's the way it is. If you want to, you can hit me for it, and and judo does it. I think that is a really, really, really pivotal thematic moment for understanding the motivations of certain people in Shar's counterattack. You know, yeah. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I think you are just having a manifestly less rich Gundam experience if you ignore Double Zeta. It is, it's it's a great show. It's an important show for the history of this series. It's an important show for the history of anime. It's just a really, really great show, and you should watch it, and it's awesome. And also, I said this on Twitter, it is worth pointing out, I think also what an achievement Double Zeta is, in that it is the first show without Shuichi Ikeda. He, he does yeah. some narration in the Prelude episode, but like that's a pretty big personality void to fill, and I think it speaks to Gundam's longevity that they were able to do it, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because they kind of proved here that they can go forward with all new characters and keep this thing going without the, the two original leads. And that's really, really important. So, great show. And we've got a, we've got a great movie ahead of us to talk about, Sean. You excited for that? Yeah, I'm really excited. You know, I'm, I'm glad that we're able to talk about a bunch of stuff that's just true for this episode. Because on the next episode, Jonathan, I think it's time we start talking about some motherfucking anime again. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs>